welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It's nine o'clock, which means it's time for a talk magic. And I'm here with somebody that I have so much respect for. One of the most successful magicians and illusionists in the UK and somebody who has done so much in their career. And we're going to talk all about it. It is the one and only Richard Young. How are you doing? How are you doing? Amazing. Uh, what an intro. Made me sound like I'm actually a success, which is incredible. You know, I think I was downplaying a little bit, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> you have. You've done so much. I mean, so many people will be watching this and they'll know you for different things because you've done so, you've reinvented yourself so many times throughout your career. It's something that you're doing again right now. You've now turned yourself into a magic dealer um, during during pandemic, which is amazing. And we'll talk all about that. But uh it's kind of like the Midas touch, isn't it? Everything that you've done, or at least from the outside looking in, everything that you've done has turned to to gold. You, you seem to be very successful with everything that you've achieved. Well, that's very sweet. I, I think I I edge more onto the side of jack of all trades, master of none, really. But that's 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 kind. Of, I do I do my best with whatever obviously I do, and I, I do I care a lot about magic. So you know, I, and and I'm I'm also quite a vocal critic of things that I don't like so you, you know it's like you know you, you put your you, you put your best into it don't you particularly if it's going to be seen by your colleagues or you know the public or something so that's very sweet that was a, that was a hell of an intro I was pretty stunned there I didn't know what to say I wasn't expecting that so thanks no problem at all well you know what let's let's go back to the very beginning just in case there's one or two people that don't know who uh Richard Young is let's go back to the very beginning um you basically been involved in magic your whole life haven't you I mean um yeah so um usual usual thing magic set for Christmas when I was eight and uh loved it I was rubbish at everything else so school sport you know so like like a lot of us I was looking for that thing that would make me feel feel special and um yeah my godmum got me a magic set and I just loved it and and really I remember the big turning point for me was there, there were two. The first one was I went to see David Copperfield uh, perform in England when he uh, toured England in 95. That just like cemented it. Like this is, you know, I love it. And then there was also this brilliant uh, one day magic convention that used to happen in Reading when I was a kid. It was organized by uh, the Home Counties Magic Society, particularly a gentleman called Keith Churcher. And it was called Junior Day. And that was incredible, like going there seeing all the kids, you know, who were all older than me. I was only, you know, 10 or 11 years old, but seeing the Keenan Lasers, the Dominic Woods, the, the Ollie Tabors, you know, all of these guys, who, and they all had acts that were good, like, and they were doing things. So, I mean, I, I've told Keenan this, like, I never entered the stage competition. I was too intimidated. Like, the standard was too good. They were brilliant. Mm. Um, and I've still got videos of Keenan doing his act. So it was just everything for me. It was it was going to that, and then and then also like, you know, you go to the dealers' room. There was a little dealers' room at Junior Day. Bob Swaddling, who's a big part of my story, would be there with Swaddling Magic, you know, with all of these amazing coins and and get, and I know Craig, you loved it as well. We've been talking about it before, haven't we? Oh yes. Now Bob's how exciting Bob's stand was, you know, with the black and the red logo, Swaddling Magic, and he'd be there, and Val would be stood there, you know taking the money and everything and oh it was so it, what, it was such an exciting time um so yeah that's he's pretty pretty normal my my story into it bob's a huge part of my story i think the third or fourth junior day i went to i was at, i i was in the um the close up competition that was for the kids you know i was 14 and bob was a judge and it was very strange, actually. I don't know if they still do this kind of thing with kids' competitions, but he, uh, after we all performed, there was five finalists, I remember. The judges kind of interviewed us as part of the process of deciding the winner, which was a bit weird. And Bob, I remember, asked, which of you five magicians have been taught by a professional and which of you are self-taught? And I'd never been helped by anybody. And so Bob later that day came and found me when I was with my dad and said, you know, you don't live too far away from me. He lived the other side of Oxfordshire, actually, it's about half an hour from where I grew up. And he said, I'd, you know, love to 
help if you if you feel that I could help. And I remember I remember I was 14, but I remember saying I don't have any money. I assumed that he wanted, you know, a gig, basically. And he and he just smiled and said, I never mentioned money. And he came to my house like every two or three weeks for like three years, never took a penny from us. And he taught me the important stuff, actually. He taught me, you know, he taught me how to do a one-handed top palm, but he also taught me the importance of learning to do it in both hands. And he, I remember him talking to me about um, how at a gig, you know, your, your job is to make that party a success, not to find the five of diamonds or something, you know? it's And so there were so many, I remember him telling me a story. I hope she won't mind me saying this, but I remember he told me a story that Kay, Kay Crystal, who's Bob's daughter, that's her stage name, Kay Crystal, that she'd done a gig and she'd gone into the, it was a house party and she'd gone into the loo and someone had been sick. She cleaned it up because her job was to make the party a success. And, you know, that would be quite an upsetting scene for either a guest or the host to come across sort of thing. So that that kind of stuff I, I've never forgotten actually. And I sort of still think about, but yeah, so he's a huge part of my story really in terms of that, how then I, end up as a professional was Bob, Bob's general and Val, you know, his wife as well, their, their generosity uh, in terms of teaching me and mentoring me. And, and like I said, I never paid them a penny because uh, I didn't have any money because I was a kid. And it was, I, I, if I really think back, I don't think I would have stuck with magic actually with, unless Bob had offered to teach me like he did. I just think I would have got distracted or I wouldn't have known where to go. I was 14 and I kind of learned you know, the magic set tricks and the few toys that they sold in Toys R Us, Magic Master, which is behind me over there. Lee Hathaway came up with those with another guy. And uh, I've gotten little collector's items from my childhood. And uh, I don't think I would have stuck with it unless Bob actually kind of showed me the kind of next level of, you know, how you be become a professional and, and the kind of, you know, the additional slights to learn that would genuinely be useful as a working magician. A one-handed top palm, is a really useful slight to know because every magician does card in wallet and actually their palms are generally terrible. If you can do a really quick one-handed top palm, you're winning. Absolutely, absolutely. And for anybody who's kind of just maybe getting into magic, how important would you say it is to find a mentor? Because I know that, and we'll talk about this later on, but you've sought out help throughout your career at different stages from people just to say, help me you know it, 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 would you say it's a very important thing to try and find from a, from a young age and or from a from a you know when you're first new into magic well i i'm gonna put this back on you i think you are a lot of people's mentors right now your channel which first of all i'm going to say you're wrong about something with your channel which i've heard you say in several of your things that it's for beginners and it's not <laughs> Because last week I watched an hour long video that you put out about the Akito box. Well, I've been in magic for 25 years. I used to own a Akito box and I had absolutely no bloody idea what you're supposed to do with it. I do now because I watch your video. Um, <laughs> and so I think you're the modern day mentor, aren't you? Like, do, do people need one? I don't think so. I don't think they do anymore. Um, maybe it's, you know, particularly we've all been living in a virtual world for the last year, maybe it'd be nice. But I mean, Craig, I look at your channel and, you know, I know we, we, we can say this, I'm true. We don't know each other, right? We're not we've okay. never hung out or anything. I, I look at your channel and the stuff you've done with it over the last seven or eight months. I go, this is all you need, you know, and it's free. It's incredible. And you, you've done great work with it. Everything from the interviews all the way through to the reviews and the rants as well, which I think are, are fun. And you're right, 90% of the time. I don't agree with you every time, but 90% of the time I agree. And so I think this is the way that people learn now. And you're, you're doing great things. And I think anyone criticizing you for exposure is an idiot because like I said, that, that video with the Akita box was an hour long. No one's watching it unless they've got a proper interest in magic. Um, this is the way that people learn now. I, you know, I said to you earlier before we started recording, I'm jealous of the way that the kids can learn now. Like it was, yeah. It was it was definitely there's, there's, it's a double edged sword to it, because I think you will agree you're you're the same sort of generation of mine, where it was more exciting, wasn't it, when we were kids? Yeah. When you would get a package in the post or you'd order something. And, and so for the kids listening to this, you probably can't imagine this, but we never saw trailers. We would read 
a description in a magic magazine <laughs> and then we would believe the description and we would order it we would send and it was slow the process as well wasn't it we would send a check or a postal order to a person in the post and then we'd have to wait and it would take a couple of weeks normally for it to arrive but damn it was exciting when it arrived and then and generally 15 minutes after it arrived that's when the disappointment sunk in Yes, absolutely, because they were scams back then as well, just like they are sometimes now. Uh, but not always. There was some great, there's some great stuff. I, I remember Bob. Bob told me recently that, like, when he invented the changing card, they put an advert in Abra magazines. That was a magic magazine back in the day, long since defunct. It was a weekly magazine that a lot of magicians got. And he said they put an advert in there, and they sold like a hundred changing cards from a printed advert, because that's the way people got their got their magic back then so so it's changed it's changed so much i think it's absolutely changed for the better i think there's of course there's always negatives to an extent but i think you know a kid well not even a kid anyone coming into magic now what a golden era to be coming in where you're able to access this stuff you're able to go and watch all of this amazing stuff you've got magicians it's not, I, I got to be honest, it's not for me i don't enjoy it but you know you've got magicians on tiktok and instagram doing a trick a day and then you can also go on youtube and go and watch all of the greats from the last 50 years as well it's just i mean it's just brilliant isn't it like i and also this past year i'm out of work like everybody else i've had a great time going and learning some stuff that i've never learned before was, no, no interest it's, magic's become my hobby again i love it yeah you know, i've been buying tricks and all that crap behind me there like it's I've been buying stuff again just for fun, not looking at it. As, 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 and this happens with a lot of working magicians that they they look at something and go, well, can I do it at a gig? If not, I'm not interested. And that's the end of it. That's literally, you know, and I was like that for many years. I would look at every single trick that I would potentially purchase or a book or a download and go, well, is this going to be something I can do at a wedding? And if not, then forget it. Well, I think the problem is when when you become a professional magician, now when you buy a trick it stops being a hobby and it starts being an investment you start thinking about expenditure and turnover and you know can i justify spending 50 pounds on this thing that i might never use at a gig and uh, it's it's why yeah i i think um you, you you've nailed it yeah and 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 so that's why how, how great your channel is that you're like I said, and I'll tell you, you're wrong. You think your channel is for beginners. You, you've re-engaged me as a, as a pro, and I'm sure there's others out there as well. I get a lot from your channel uh, in terms of watching. I loved your chat with John Archer and Russ Stevens and Mark Oberon the other day I watched with his new product, and, and it's, it's good. So, yeah, I, in, to answer your question, a very long answer is, uh, yeah, I don't think you need a mentor. I think you can learn stuff online and naturally you'll make friends. I think the one thing I would say, we've all got great friends in magic. Um, if you're young, I definitely recommend joining the, the Young Magicians Club. When life goes back to normal, I know your son Ryland wants to be a member. Uh, I've, I've got lifelong friends from the Young Magicians Club. Like I met Andy Gladwin at the Young Magicians Club. Like He's my friend still Like all these years later. So friendship's a huge part of magic. And so go to the conventions. Uh, go you know as and when they're back and go go to the, the the young magician days it's such a huge part of magic and it's why you'll stick with it um because you'll meet other people doing you never you're never all doing the same thing either like one of you'll be doing learn the one hand top palm another one will be learning a hot shot cut and you, you'll go i want to learn that next because that looks brilliant like it's all fun isn't it so yeah one thing that has changed though you know you mentioned all these incredible performers that you met back in the day when you were 10 years old that were a little bit older than you and they were all putting stage acts together. When I first got into magic and I was younger, it wasn't about learning how to do the ambitious card or learning how to do coins across. My, I, I really wanted to chair suspension. I, you know, it, I, it was more focused on stage magic back then. These days, I think that a lot of people that get into magic, they've got no intention of performing on stage. It's, it's, it's all about the close-up these days. Yeah, it's a real shame. I've spoken to Kevin, who runs the Young Magicians Club, about it. I, I, I'll, I'll be completely honest. I went to Junior Day. Uh, they, they very kindly, Kevin asked me to interview someone 
every year for the kids. So I've interviewed Scott Penrose and Richard Cadell and, and I, the, the late great Anthony Owen, and they've always been fantastic. So, and I love going back to junior day and seeing the remembering, you know, it brings back a lot of memories for me. And I, um, yeah, I just, I, I kind of feel like, I said this to Kevin that what the kids are not interested in stage magic, that the quality of the stage competition is, 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 is way off what it was when we were kids. And he's like, well, they, they just love the, they love the close up stuff. And so there's a side to me that goes, no, don't be close up magicians. Like try and be, you know, Dynamo did a big arena tour. Like, did you not see it? That's what you should be aspiring for. But but you know what? It's totally up to everybody individually, isn't it? What you like and what you love is, is us. Some people love rope magic, like, and that's what they want to do and fine. So I think sometimes we can get a little bit, like, what else can we do other than encourage and show them great stage magic, right? Maybe it's up to us, you know, to, to be at Blackpool and, and Ru what a great job Russ does there now, Russ and Russ, the, the, the last few years, those gala shows, I mean, if I'd have seen those gala shows when I was a kid, they would have they would have provided me with a year long amount of inspiration. And so, I'm sure it is happening, you know. But it's just not as prom prominent as the the close up stuff is. It seems to be with the kids. But you know, look at look at Izzy. Izzy was on stage, wasn't she? Like, and so you go, well, they they would have seen that, and they want to be Izzy because she's on she was on the big stage at Blackpool. I'm sure that's one of the reasons why perhaps you know she was booked was because you know it's really important that kids see other kids doing great things so yeah but I, I don't have any I don't know about, I've, I've been genuinely interested to know your thoughts Craig like I remember asking Paul Daniels does he worry about the future of magic and he said no and uh I don't either really I don't know about you I go Ooh. I think I think the future of magic is bright you know um I think that if you look at the last time BGT was on half of the acts in the final were magic acts and they weren't the acts that were put through by the judges they were the acts that were put through by the general public now that tells me something uh and i think that half the battle these days is making sure that the general public want magic because if they want magic then automatically there's going to be more magicians i mean the thing i think is that we need to be more inclusive i've talked about this before about elitism and magic and i think that you know we need to be more welcoming and we don't need to guard the secrets but we just need to kind of protect them uh and i think that's the if there is ever going to be a downfall of magic it's going to be people pushed away or feeling that they're not welcome within the community especially with a lot of the online stuff i've seen young magicians get attacked on places like the magic cafe and you know they've asked one innocent question and and people have said hey you're an idiot or whatever it may be i think that we need to be more welcoming i think and more, more inclusive yeah i i will be honest i didn't watch all of it i got dragged away but i watched some of your chat with uh oh, what's his uh the i know his first name that is dan rhodes isn't it dan the, the the tiktok magician and he exposed himself and i saw your chat with him and I, as I said, I didn't watch all of it, but I, I felt like you handled it really well. Like, here's a kid. I'm sure he's not offended. I call him a kid. He is, he's a, he's yeah. not an adult yet, and he's he's uh, doing his thing. And I think you did you handled it the right way. There's a way to have a conversation with someone younger when they're still finding their way without scaring them off. Or, and also, let's be blunt. Like that generation. I mean, is it? They call them snowflakes, don't they? Like they're all very delicate, like because of the world they're growing up in with with social media and stuff. So we do need to not be quite as harsh on them. I've heard the stories of the way Alan Allen was with, uh, you know, Noel Britton and Richard McDougall and Michael Vince. He was hard on them, you know, like, and it worked. They're all brilliant. I don't think that works anymore, does it? For kids, you can't do that. So I think they need to be loved, not not, not kicked. I don't think it works in the same way. I'm not a parent. You are. Maybe you know better than me. Do you kick yeah, Ryland or? No, I, I tend not to kick him. I'll try not to. Um, occasionally. No, he's uh, he's a good he's a good kid. But yeah, I mean, Dan's a good kid as well, to be perfectly honest. But uh, I think that 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 you know somebody like Dan is a perfect example. He's got three and a half million followers on TikTok. I mean, that's huge. He ha he puts a video up. He gets literally a hundred thousand views within an hour or two so if if my opinion is we should be bringing people like dan on side because he's the per if he's doing it right 
and the other magicians that are on TikTok that are influencers are doing it right, then just more people are going to get interested in magic, which is great for the community, great for the economy, great for dealers like Prop Dog, more magicians, more money. It's 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 all good, really. Um, they, they do. They eat through material, these uh, Instagrammers and TikTokers. So they're constantly buying tricks because they need material. So um, James Samuels the other day, who's big on TikTok, he's got like a million uh, subscribers, and he was uh, he was in 4MG, you know, the four, the boy yep. band of magic, and um, uh, he was he was just showing me boxes of stuff that he's bought from eBay, like really rubbish tricks that you'd never dream of doing in a gig. And all of a sudden, he can take something like a dice bomb, which you'd never do. And he can just do this on camera and go, hey, I'm, I'm James Samuels. Welcome to my TikTok channel. Look at this. Three, two, one, boom. And he'll get like a million views, thousands of comments. It's, uh, it's, do you know what's amazing? Actually, a trick like that. So last summer, when everything went uh, to crap, um, uh, it was a little thing I'd always wanted to do and never done it. And I thought I'm going to do it was I'd always wanted to try and sell Svengali decks. And so Edward Hilsom and I, it's a bit of a joke, really, bought a box of Svengali decks and went down to the local market. <laughs> and and we bought a few other things where we had a stiff rope. Oh, what was the other stuff? Like a pen through note. Oh, just, you know, cheap, cheap. We would say cheap rubbish. But, you know, you forget how powerful a Svengali deck is. Like, it's incredible. People can't believe it. And you say it's £10, they can't take two. Like, it's like, you just forget this stuff because we're always looking for the next thing, the new thing. And the public don't have a clue. Like, you know, they, 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 they know, they, they have a good instinct. They know what's good magic, bad magic. They know what's a good magician, a bad magician. But they don't know what's new or old. And so a Svengali deck, I mean, I wish there was a way it was acceptable for magicians to do it at gigs, because I'm telling you, I'm, I was, for many years, I was a very busy working close-up magician. I, I was never one of the big boys that you'd heard of, like Nick Einhorn or Etienne Pradier, you know, I wasn't that level, but, but I was busy. I, I did a lot of gigs. And I'm telling you, the reactions I got from a Svengali deck in a market last summer were equal to doing bottle through table at a wedding which is anyone in, who does weddings knows that is a trick that will literally get you booked. And it is the one they will chase you across the room to watch it again. And they will, you know, they'll, they, they go crazy for it. Well, I'm telling you, it's the same as a Svengali deck in a market. They go off and get their mates and come back and say, do it again. Cause they can't believe it. So there's a lot of stuff in magic that's overlooked. And I think that's a good thing. If these TikTok guys are kind of making people realize like, Oh, that is good. An exploding die. Um, it's good. It really is. And, and look at, uh, Look at the amount of magicians that have become super successful, having worked in places like Marvin's Magic. You mean Andy Nyman, <laughs> you know, just for a start. You know, the amount of people that have gone through being a magic demonstrator. I think being a magic demonstrator really helps you as a performer because one of the things that I think a lot of close-up magicians struggle with isn't maybe necessarily the technical side of things. It's the getting people to like you. Because a lot of people forget that with close-up magic, you've got to walk over to a group of people that don't know you within a couple of seconds, get them to not only like you, but want to actually stop their conversation and listen to what you say. And, you know, that's a, that's a technique that you learn as a magic demonstrator that I've seen so many magicians, technically wonderful, but they just don't know how to, you know. I think it's the, uh, the skill that you need, the biggest skill you need as a working close-up magician is the ability to talk to people on different levels and to, to, to judge that introduction. You won't always get it right. The way you'll get good at it is to get it wrong, ultimately. Um, and, you know, you can be, I don't think there's anything wrong being a little bit apologetic. I really don't. I think some magicians who hate that, you know, um, why should I apologize? So I'm here working the ring. Well, they don't know that at that moment. Um, so I've certainly always been, I love Faye Presto's line when she says, it's my job to entertain you for two minutes. It will seem longer. What a great, it just immediately you go, okay, she's, she's let you know it's her job. She's going to entertain us. And she's made a joke that's genuinely very funny. Like it's perfect. Right. And so I certainly look at it and I, and also something I learned when I was doing it is every now and again, you'll approach a group of people and you'll introduce yourself in a very polite way. And they will say, no, thank you. 
and they don't want to see it. And in my early days, I used to take, I used to take that very badly. I used to be very hurt. Foolish. You've got no idea what's going on in that conversation. They could be talking about someone who's just died or they might be about to sign a multi-million pound deal if you're at a corporate event. So don't take it personally when someone rejects you. It's just part of, it's part of it. It's part of the job. And it's, it's, it's a bit tough to deal with, but it's just part of it, especially if you do it a lot. The rudest people I've ever met in my life, I met at Close Up Gigs. You know, I, remember, I still remember, I went to the story, it's not very interesting, but I remember I did a gig once and a woman said something so awful to me. It was extremely personal. She made a quip about me and it cut through me like a knife and affected me for weeks, you know, because we're all quite, although we, we portray this thing that we're confident and we're, we can, you know, command a table of 10 or 12 or maybe even more people join and it becomes a little parlor show. We're all actually at our core. I think we're all quite sensitive and worried about, we know what we're doing. We're interrupting. It's a bit rude. Um, yeah, it's all part, it's all part of the process, but it's the thing that you, it's the biggest skill you need if you want to do it professionally you need you need seven or eight really good tricks to get started and make sure your first few gigs you're you're in a room with a lot of people so you can get lost in it the worst thing will be to turn up at a gig and this will happen in your career where you'll turn up at a gig and there's 20 people and you book for two hours that's they're tough gigs and that's happened to everybody at some point where the booker mm -hmm. doesn't let you know that circumstances have changed or there's been a traffic problem or something but those first few gigs, if you can turn up and there's a hundred people and you book for an hour and a half, like you'll be fine walking around. But the skill you need to then learn to acquire, now you can do a really good ambitious card routine and a, a great Svengali routine, whatever it is you're doing at the gig, it's fine to do Svengali. Um, you heard it from me. Uh, then, um, yeah, like the next skill you need to learn is is, is that social thing that is the, is the, to get to get people where you can interrupt them. They're fine with it. They understand and they will then let you do your thing. It's a real skill. I'd love to see more magicians lecture on it and talk about it, actually. Maybe you could do a little video. I think I will. I, I'm actually making a mental note to do it because you are right. I think people need to be mindful that not everybody is in the right position. I, I had, uh, we're going back to when Blockbuster video was around. And I had a friend who had a residency in a local restaurant every Friday night. And I knew the magician very well. And I also had another friend who worked in Blockbuster. And my friend who, were, uh, who had the residency called me on the Friday night after the gig and said, I've just had a really rude table. This woman was absolutely horrible. She told me to go away. She shouted at me to go away. I'd, 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 I was halfway through my second trick and she told me to get lost. And I went into Blockbuster Video where my friend worked the following day. And she said, oh, I had a horrible situation. I was in um, uh, this place and this magician came over and I had to tell him to go away because I'd, 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 I'd invited my boyfriend out for a meal because my intention was to dump him and I was just about to dump him and he came over and wouldn't stop showing us card tricks. So I, you know, but, but that, I saw both sides of the, right there, I saw both sides of the coin. And it's, it's interesting that, you know, you're never, the, you're never the bad guy in your own story, are you? You know, it's always something. Yes, that, spot on, you're never the bad guy. And, and, and yeah, like, you know, I remember walking over to a table once and I, I, they told me to go away and I was like, okay. It was weird because it was a wedding and people are normally very receptive at weddings. But they told me to go away. And about 20 minutes later, a lady came over and said, oh, the, the gentleman that was sat on the table, he, he wasn't feeling very well. And we were all a bit worried. Yep, yeah, I would have had no idea in that first five or 10 seconds walking over that that was going on on the table sort of thing. So it's, it, yeah, you just got to accept it as part of it, really. And also, if you, if you just accept when it happens that it's just part of it and you'll never really know what it was. So you'll just be fine with it and be able to let it go. Absolutely. Now, talking about close-up magic, obviously, you you uh, left education, you became a magician. Did you ever have aspirations of being a stage performer? Because obviously, we know you now as a stage performer, very successful illusion act, which we'll get to in a bit. Was that the end goal? Or, or, or was it really that you were happy doing close-up magic and that opportunity presented itself? So that's a good question, actually. I have to think about it myself, actually, to go back to what, how I used to think about it. So I loved David Copperfield when I was a kid, but I think you learn very quickly as you, as you grow up that the opportunities to do that kind of magic, particularly in this country, are extremely limited. So you realise if you want to be a professional magician, uh, again, Faye talks 
very eloquently about this. You have to perform close-up magic in this country, really. Or you can be a children's entertainer. Actually, I will say things have changed a bit in the last few years. There are more, there's various ways now you can make a living as a magician. But back when I was, you know, in my late teens, early twenties, the way to do it was to do close-up magic. And so that was what I did. And I kind of loved stage magic, but kind of thought there'll never be a way to do it. But one of the things that happened, I, I don't mind saying this, is, is I was quite surprised how much money I was making, actually. Um, I was still living with my parents and my close-up magic business picked up reasonably quickly. And so I had some savings. And so rather than doing the right thing, which was save up to move out of my parents' house, I went and, born, I, I went and bought an origami illusion, uh, as you do. And uh, my mum and dad were furious when they came home. And I, I decided I had decided I was going to keep it in the kitchen, uh, but I didn't tell them that's where I was planning to keep it. And it's quite a funny story. It, it was my favourite illusion. If you've never seen the origami illusion, look it up. It's an incredibly deceptive illusion. You'll have absolutely no idea how the person uh, who goes inside it is in it. Is in it. It's 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 just it's spectacular. It's, it's, it's quite old now, but. It's still beautiful, and I I don't mind saying so. I never performed it live. I just was terrified of it. I had so much respect for it, and I had a few opportunities to do it, and I just always backed out. I just I was scared of it. I was scared of it going wrong, or because unlike close up magic with illusions, there's genuinely quite a lot that can go wrong, and when they go wrong, it's pretty catastrophic a lot of the time. There isn't really a way out of it, and so I never performed it. But so I had it, and then I sold it. And got rid of it and then I sort of bought another illusion and thought no, I will definitely perform this one and I did and then I just got a bit bored of being a close-up magician if I'm being honest and the the love for the stage magic came back I took my first trip to Vegas and I saw Copperfield again and loved it and uh it sort of the, it reignited all of my passion for it so I end up I, I own like two or three illusions and there was a little theater in the town next to where I live. It's a hundred seats. And so that's enough that you can fill it with friends and family, right? <laughs> People, you put a post on your Facebook and say you're doing your first ever magic show and your friends and family will come to support you. And uh, it was also Sam Strange, who is now my double act partner Strange and another magician called James Bryan. He's, a, he's not a magician anymore, great friend of mine, known him my whole life. And we put the show on this magic show with the three of us. And I did these illusions and it, and it just, it just went from there. Just that first time of being, and it was this little tiny theater, but it was a theater and everybody was facing the right way and the lights went down and they'd all bought a ticket. And oh, it's, it's so amazing. It's such an amazing way of doing magic better than any other way in my, in my opinion, you know, better than storming a table at a corporate event or doing a, after dinner show at a corporate event or doing a you know doing a tv appearance i've done some of those as well like there's nothing like a theater with an audience in that have come to see magic once you do it i think you i think you're hooked really if you if you really love it i agree because one of the things that i love about that if you have uh, when you go on stage once you've walked out on stage and you've got that audience and you know you've got them you then have 30 to 45 minutes to take them on a journey. With close-up magic, you have five or six minutes at best, and they can be the best table in the world. But then you've got to go over and win, them, win an entirely new group over and do it again and again and again. And it gets tiring. Um, it can get very, very tiring. So I totally understand where you're coming from. Yeah, you can, you can do such more interesting things. You don't have to rush things. You, you're never worried you're going to lose their attention. Like, They'll be patient and they'll stick with you. You can tell a story. But also, here's something like I, I really, I really, really, I, I hope this doesn't sound arrogant, but once you do close up magic professionally for a few years, you do get good at it. And it does become fairly easy to do once you've once you've got the idea of the, the dynamic and you're, you've performed in every terrible environment. And um, it, you can get very, it can become very, very comfortable. Stage magic is very, very challenging to do. There's a lot to it and a lot can go wrong. And there's lots of extra things to consider that you don't have to do at a gig or like the music and the lighting and all these things. And they're big elements of it actually. 
and the staging and the way you, there's, there's just so much more to it. The way you walk, the way you, your first line, your last line. Um, so it's just, it is, in my opinion, it's just a lot more interesting than, uh, than doing gigs, uh, you know, doing close up magic gigs. Um, and so that's why for me, it, I never, I'm not going to claim that I planned to be an illusionist as a career because I never thought it was possible. I, I can be honest and say that I'm very, very lucky um, that I'm able now to make my living. I, I haven't done a close up job for two years now, you know. Um, actually, that's not true. I did, did do one, uh, but, you know, it's not, it's not where, it's not where I make my living anymore. And doing my stage show has been the way I've made my living primarily for the last several years certainly I've got you know I do my business accounts and I've got like young and strange and close-up magic and just literally over the last five years you know see it it's gone like that you know it's like less of close-up and more of more of the stage stuff which was absolutely what I wanted it to do so yeah that's that for me that's how I've ended up doing it it's not I'm not didn't plan it I just I got I got very fortunate actually I really did I've got very very fortunate and I've, I've worked hard at it and also with stage magic, one final thing I'll say about it, you have to put your money where your mouth is. It's expensive. Like you think that a trick at Prop Dog that's just come in that's 75 quid is a lot of money. Well, you wait till you're dabbling with illusions or proper work stage routines. I mean, I we have paid over the years thousands of pounds just for performance rights. That's just to get the permission to do it from the inventor. Um, you know, so and and then the props themselves, you know, thousands and you know, the costumes. You know, it, it just goes on and on and on. And also, if you're doing an illusion act, you can't rehearse it in your bedroom. You, every time we've done it, Craig, you'll know this from your your time doing it. Every time you want to rehearse, you need to hire a, a vehicle. You need to hire a, a local village hall or a local theatre, and you need to hire your assistant for the day. So maybe you've got an assistant, and he or she is going to be doing the gig with you well guess what they're going to need a rehearsal day and you have to pay them for that too so there's a lot more money in it unfortunately for strange and i the close-up magic money always uh always paid for it it was silly really you know like i said i should have moved out of my parents house back in the day and i, I left much later than i should have but we did we we pumped money into the act and because it was exciting to us and thrilling so it is quite expensive and it's why there's not many people doing it ultimately as well. There's many more magicians doing close up magic and children's parties and virtual shows. than there are doing, you know, manipulation acts or uh, illusion acts because it's, it's just a lot more. It's a lot more difficult and it's a lot more expensive. 100 percent. And even the little things that close up magicians wouldn't even consider to be a thing are huge. It's, it, it's so true. But I want to ask you a question. You're a very successful close-up magician. And to be clear, you're downplaying a little bit, but I mean, you have performed close-up magic at some very high profile events over your career. You then decide to go into doing stage magic. I suppose I have two questions here. One, how did you form a double act? And, and, and how did that work from a financial point of view? And I'm genuinely interested because I had a business partner that I did the double act with for many, many years. And it was very, very awkward in terms of, well, I've got my own. How do I prioritize gigs over here? You know, are you on the same page in terms of growing the illusion show? Or what happens if this gig gets offered and we're doing a really cheap illusion? It, there's so many factors. And you, you, and, you and Sam, you know, you are now probably, the, no, definitely the top double act. You know, I mean, it, in the, in the UK, I mean, and we'll talk about that in the future, but how how did you find Sam? And how did, how did, I mean, obviously you performed on stage together, but how did that turn into Young and Strange as we know now? You know, and how did you manage that whole thing at the beginning? Yeah, so so Sam and I, um, so the, we tell the story in like, you know, whenever we do an interview on like a press spot or something that we met when we were kids, and it's, it's not true. The, 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 we realize that's the story people want to hear. They just do when they look at a double act like Anton Deck or Morecambe and Wise, like people, the public like to think that oh, these two have been friends forever. You know, they grew up with each other. And so we, we, we told the true story at the beginning and realized people didn't like it. So we decided to change it to the story they wanted to hear and said, oh, we met when we were kids. Um, 
but so Sam and I were both working as close-up magicians. That's how we met, actually. And we're both a similar age. And our lives until a few years ago were very, very similar in terms of, you know, neither of us, um, you know, went to uni and got a degree. I, I did go to uni, I dropped out, but <laughs> I never got a degree. Uh, you know, we didn't, weren't good at many other things, but we both were doing reasonably well, doing close-up gigs in and around Oxford. And we kept hearing each other's names um, and we got played off each other with prices and things. And so we met and um, Sam loves uh, card manipulation. He loves it. And he's been really good at it for a long, long time. And uh, he loves also card cheating and things. And so I love all the illusions. And so when I pitched the idea of us doing that show, I said, oh, you could, you know, we could do this show together. You could do whatever you want. And so I think he saw it as, oh, I can do my, I can do my card minutes, you know, which really did, you know, the first night you did it, everyone loved it. And um, so that's kind of how it started. But you're right. What happened was that we were doing close-up jobs and then also trying to do Young and Strange around it. Now, I will be honest and say, I will tell you the truth and I will also caveat it by saying it probably was not the right thing to do. We would always put Young and Strange first. So if Young and Strange got an opportunity for a gig, Young and Strange did the gig. And if I already had a drinks reception booked at the Birmingham Metropole for some corporate company on the same evening, well, they I I cancelled on the I cancelled the gig and I never dropped them in the crap. I would always send you know, I would always say I'm so sorry I can't make it. Here's a brilliant magician. I, I was always also aware that they they just wanted a magician anyway. Like it was a they were very rarely were they booking me specifically. They'd found me online. They were looking for a magician. So as long as you gave them an alternative, they were normally absolutely fine with it. Uh, in fact, I can't think of any occasion that they weren't. But so we always put Young and Strange first and, and did every possible opportunity we did. And we did a lot of those gigs where we did it for the opportunity. This is a good opportunity for you guys. Um, anytime we were able to perform on a stage, we did it. We did gigs for... 25 50 pounds didn't even cover the petrol and that's and you just have to do that when you you start the big the, there were two things that happened they both happened in 2011 that cemented us as an act the first one was that we got onto Penn and Teller fool us um and I mean literally when they offered us the spot on that we weren't even called young and strange they said what's the name of the act we, we need to put it on the screen we were like I don't know we hadn't even named the act and uh and then the second thing was that off the back of that, we, before it even aired, we kind of were going, well, how, do, how are we going to capitalize on this? Because it was, it was, it was ITV1 Saturday night primetime TV. So we had no idea what to expect. Whether, but we thought maybe something will come from this. And so we agreed we were going to go and do the Edinburgh Festival. So the Edinburgh Fringe Festival runs every August in Edinburgh. It's the world's biggest arts festival. It's one city, but believe it or not, every day there are three to four thousand shows on every day and every space in Edinburgh there is a show whether it is a theatre or it is a university sports hall or it's the back room of a pub they turn every available space into a theatre basically it's incredible it's the most amazing place to visit in August and if you've never been you should go if you're serious about your magic because there's about 80 magic shows on every day and everything from terrible magic shows to brilliant some of the best magic shows I've ever seen I've seen at the Edinburgh Festival and you learn just as much from a good show as you do from a bad one um so yeah and that was it so those two events sort of doing Fool Us and then also doing the Edinburgh Festival in 2011 and we had we were dreadful like the show was terrible and you know we didn't have a clue what we were doing but it was 23 days where we did a show every single day but an hour, an hour of material but going back very quickly to Fool Us your act was brilliant like I, I still remember it to this day, the the sub trunk, but it wasn't a sub trunk with the with the curtain. It was it, it really so it was a breath of fresh air when it came to illusion acts, because normally illusion acts are presented in the same way. And as much as I love him and I'm not dissing him at all, most illusion acts copy the Russ Stevens school of performing illusions, you know, that, 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 which is great. Um, but you guys went in a completely different direction. Yeah. So, so to give you the timeline, 2010, we do our first ever show. Towards the end of 2010, when we realised we wanted to take things a little bit more seriously, 
we approached Andy Nyman at the Magic Circle one evening. It was the, the flea market. It was just selling, everyone just selling their old tricks. And Ny Nyman was there. And so this is 2010. So at this point, Andy is, as well as being an amazing actor, has already won Olivier's with Darren Brown, you know. And I said to Strange, like, do you reckon he'd, do you reckon he'd help us? Like, do you reckon we could hire him? Like, everyone's got a price, right? <laughs> like... <laughs> And so we literally, it's, it's, it's embarrassing to say this, but we just literally just waited outside until he left. And when he came out, we just like cornered him and was like, you know, um, could we hire you? Like, could we, you know, could you, would you do consultancy like for other people other than Darren? And he kind of like stroked his beard and was like, oh, guys, it's, you know, I could tell you two young guys, like, it's really expensive and, and, he was always like apologising for look, the, the fact is the guys at the absolute top of the game. Of course, it was expensive, you know. And so he we, we he gave us his phone number and his email address and we did. We chased it up, you know, and he, he was again still, if I'm being honest, he was a bit reluctant to do it. And eventually, you know, we pestered and pestered and he, and he gave us a price and we could just about get there. Like it was, it was, it was a lot of money, but it was like, we believed it was the right thing to do. And that day with Andy Nyman is why we are not what you just said, Craig, why we are not this and try and look cool because Andy Nyman on that first consultancy day with us, didn't talk about tricks, didn't talk about jokes. He made us stand in a mirror and look in a mirror and said, look, look at you two one tall guy, skinny, and the other one short. And he never called me fat. He said, you're short and stocky. It's a comedy act. You can still do the illusions, but it's a comedy act. That's what it needs to be. And, and it will be, it, it can be really good. I mean, the best, best advice ever really. And once that clocked and once that went in and, and then also you kind of go, you do start to see it actually. Then you do start to see all these magicians out there. And there's a lot of them doing poses still. And I don't think they don't really know why they're doing it. They just, they think that's what you're meant to do. And if you're doing a fire spiker, that's what you have to do. And you don't actually. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was, a, that was a game changer for us. And, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not great. Uh, we, we, we're, we're good. I think now I, I really, I've said this before. I think really genuinely strange. And I've only got good actually in the last two or three years, we've worked so hard at it and invested so much money and we've pained over it. And we've so many people been involved, like great people we've brought in to help us over the years, you know, consultants and things um, that it, I think it is now it's a, it's a good act and it goes well mo most of the time. And uh, and I'm not going to lie and say all the time because it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't always go well is because it's an extremely complicated act. The, particularly the last 15 minutes of our act, it has more in common with a West End musical than it has with a magic show. There are hundreds of lighting cues, music cues, pyro cues. There's, there's 15 people working flat out to make it work. And if one of us screws up, the thing doesn't really get, look good. And so it's complicated. Um, but that was really the moment that that conversation with Andy all those years ago uh, saying, you know, it should be a comedy act and you should do the big stuff, but do it with a bit of a wink in the eye. People think they're ridiculous. They don't understand them anyway. Uh, this was something I learned. They also don't really like them, dare I say it. The public don't really like illusions until they see them. Yeah, once they see them, they do, but they've never seen them, but they have seen them on television a lot of the time, and it doesn't connect as well on television. There are some magicians who have done it brilliantly on TV. A lot of the stuff Russ has done BGT when James Moore was on it and Darcy and all that stuff that Russ, it looked great. And all the Copperfield stuff back in the day on TV looked great. And there are others too, but there's often it's not great. And so the public don't think they're going to enjoy it. But when they are watching an illusion act and it's done with a lot of energy and it's bright and colorful and there's pyro and music and it's fun and the performers look like they're having a good time actually it really surprises them they do enjoy it um so yeah that that that's the kind of thing that sort of cemented it in terms to going this is the direction we're now going to head in uh is kind of doing it as an illusion act not trying to be cool being having fun let make sure the audience can see we love doing it we do, like, we absolutely love it. It's such a privilege to do an illusion on stage because it's difficult to find a stage to do them on. 
And so every time we do it, we have a great time. I think that really comes across. Well, before we carry on, maybe you can put a rumour to rest. Go for it. When you went on Pen and Teller Fool Us, I remember on Facebook, on the various different forums, they were buzzing. And the reason they were buzzing is because Pen said something very cryptic at the end about your act. And everybody in the community thought that either you or Sam had a twin or something, because he said that you're going to keep this under wraps and you can't tell anyone and you keep this a secret and you'll be huge. Nobody knew what it was. Everybody was speculating. Can we put, I mean, obviously, you know what he talked about because you both nodded and kind of shushed him up immediately. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Can we talk about that? I mean, yeah, we can. Do you know what the one of the most fun that? things was? So, so listen, I, I will go by the rule we set at the beginning, which is if you are still listening to me talking rubbish this far into the interview, you have earned the right to 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 know what was going on. So, so yes, yeah, so the illusion we did was basically a, a transposition effect where Strange and I switched places, but Strange appeared at the back of the theatre very quickly, like mind numbingly quickly like how is that possible and the, the the method was sam has an identical twin brother called barney who is an amazing guy and uh was very happy to help us in the infancy of our act when we were starting and it's literally what how we got on the show as unknowns because it's a great secret and it's so in line with what they're trying to do they were trying to do with fool us at the time where at the time they really didn't know whether the how important is it going to be the falling thing and the secret? Now you watch it, you understand it's a showcase for magic. But back then, and so one of the most fun things that happened was that Sam and I were known by a few magicians as two close-up magicians. So Alan Hudson, Old Qualter, Angelo Carbone, all these guys, they, they kind of knew us, but they knew us as close-up magicians. And so we turn up at the audition for Penn and Teller Fool Us with Sam's twin, but he's in the van. OK, he's not going to come into the room until it's absolutely necessary. So we turn up and, and in the room are these magicians, you know, because it was a bit unusual, actually. They, they let the magicians stay after they auditioned. They let them just stay and watch other people audition. It was a bit weird. Anyway, so we do this thing. And there was no way that the, the, the audition room, there was no way to the back of the room. So what we did, they were at, there was the, the whole side of the building was glass and outside there was a big hill. And so what we did was we did the transposition, but then Sam was up on the hill outside and they couldn't believe it. And it was so powerful because of the fact these magicians knew Sam personally, but they did not know he was a twin. Wow. And so it, there was magi these magicians there and uh, Alan Hudson and Old Coulter, oh, you know, they, they will tell you they, they, they proper for a moment was, were like, what has just happened kind of thing. <laughs> now, what's interesting is that the production people were impressed, eh, not as much as the magicians, because they didn't know Sam. And this is something I'll say about the method of twins. It's not as good as you think it is. The, the lay public do not know what a Svengali deck is or how it works. They do not know about an invisible thread reel or a double lift. But a normal person, your next door neighbor knows that identical twins exist in life. They literally know a method. And so actually, when you pull off a miracle like that, for a normal person, it's not a massive jump. And, and it's OK, it's the magician himself, but it's still not absolutely beyond the realms of possibility that he has a twin brother. So actually, the few times we did it for the public, we we didn't do it right. We, we did it too, too brash and, and actually normal people did figure it out. Um, so anyway, so we do it and uh, the production people loved it and they offered us a spot on the show. And uh, so we, we had no idea what would happen. Obviously we go out in front of Penn and Teller, we do it. And I could, it's a, many years ago now, but I can still remember it very, very clearly. It's a very strong memory for me. We finish it, Sam appears at the back of the room and they kind of look a bit surprised but you know it's a big tv studio and there's lots of wings and things so it goes okay but it's not you know and i see penn and teller chat you know we're stood 10 meters away from them so you can't hear them but you can see and so they come they come to them and they say um so uh what you did was that big screen thing 
came in and you ran out the back and you ran round. You had enough time because by that point, we'd already learned to slow it down and put the element of doubt in it that it will, might have been something other than that. If you do it instantaneously, like teleportation, there, I'm telling you, there's only one method. Yeah. It's not the same person. If you do slow it down, you put a delay in, well, now maybe there's a different way. And so Penn and Teller, it worked. Penn and Teller did think that he'd exited the stage through a secret door and he legged it round as quickly as he could. So, of course, we know that's not, not the method. So well, bear in mind, we're nobodies at this point. Like, you know, we're brand new to all of this. So very proudly, we kind of said to Jonathan Ross, that's not how we did it. The crowd went wild because they thought we had them. And I never forget this. I looked back at Penn and Teller and I saw Teller turn to Penn and I could read his lips. He said, then it can only be a twin. And so Penn then kind of flustered. Bear in mind, the whole show's new at this point. It was like the third day they'd ever filmed it. And Penn said, well, how do I say that? And then, so he kind of said, so what he actually said on the night is he said, um, I don't know how to say this without just saying it. So I'll try and be as cryptic as I can, but is it something genetic? And so at that point we said, thanks very much. You got us. Goodbye. Here's where Penn and Teller was such a classy act. If you've ever seen the clip, you'll realize that everything I just said to you, you've not seen. No. That's because uh, afterwards, Penn, Teller and Johnny Thompson got together and discussed it. And I heard, heard about this subsequently afterwards. They agreed that it would screw us over and we wouldn't be able to continue to do it. it would, people would guess what it was. And so they had a discussion that night and they were filming the next day as well. And they made a decision that the following day they would do a pickup shot and they would change the language. And so what you actually see on the TV clip is you see Penn say, supposedly to me and Strange, although actually we weren't there. And the way you can tell this was shot on a different night is the people behind Penn change, they're different people. And Penn says uh, to us, uh, so let me ask you, so you're, you're a team and we're a team but we can't do that trick, can we? Only you guys can do that trick. And um, that's what, what went out. What's fascinating is actually a lot of people in the comments on YouTube at the time, there were a lot of people saying, well, what does that mean? Like it did create a bit of buzz, but there were people who still figured it out. And uh, there was quite a funny story. There was a few people who really went to town to prove that Barney really existed. And in the run up to the show, we'd really... Um, we'd been really careful to kind of eliminate Barney from the internet. This was the early days, but you know, Facebook was around, Twitter was around. And so we, Barney was very kind and agreed that he would delete everything while the show went out. And we forgot there was this old website called Bebo and we'd totally forgotten about it. And uh, sure enough, Barney's Bebo profile was still live. And also someone, this was, this was where it went too far in my opinion, someone, some crazy guy also went to the electoral register and found the strangest household address. And of course on it, there was uh, Mr. S strange, Mr. B strange, and they had the same date of birth. So like that was bonkers that someone did that, but it's all part of the fun. So yeah, that's the story of it. Barney, the story of using Barney in the show, I hate, sorry to use the word using, but we, you know, he was part of the app for a while. Um, uh, I, I know they, Sam and Barney won't mind me saying this, um, it's not, it wasn't a nice gig for Barney, really. He was hidden in boxes, locked away in cars, hidden in offices. He's a really smart guy. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a doctor now. And uh, he, he helped us for a while. And we'd roll him out for the odd special occasion. But it, it wasn't good for... It wasn't... I, I think it's fair to say that at times it wasn't good for their relationship as brothers. It got a bit... You know, Sam was stood there being the big star and Barney was in a box somewhere in the background. So we didn't... And, and also, like I said, actually, it became clear it wasn't actually as good as we thought it was. We really thought it was something, you know, that was amazing, but it, it wasn't really. They, they didn't... When we would do our full show, and it said at the time we were booking these little theatres in and around our hometown, we were doing those fairly frequently... And we'd put on a whole evening show, you know, we'd have illusions, Sam do his card minutes, we'd do silk and egg, all the stuff we had. They, the, the, the illusion with Barney wasn't actually the thing people would leave talking about. It just wasn't. So uh, we retired, don't think we, we haven't used Barney now for maybe eight years or something. Um, it just, yeah. And, uh, and actually Sam and Barney, weirdly over the last few years, they, they look fairly 
different now. At the time, they looked, I mean, they were absolutely identical, but they live different lives now. You know, Barney's up, uh, he lives up north and he's married and, and Sam lives down. They don't spend a lot of time together. They've got very different lifestyles. So they, 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 I don't think we could get away with it anymore either. It wouldn't, they, they just don't quite look like they used to in terms of the, the being the same. But it was helpful to get your first big break on um, on, on TV, you know, with, uh, with Penn and Teller, which is, which is, which is great. Now, so Young and Strange is now is now an act. You've gone to Edinburgh. You've gone to uh, you've been on Penn and Teller. You've had a couple of other TV spots. As you've already said, you can see that your close up money is coming down here and your Young and Strange money is coming up here, which is fantastic. Would you say that the next big career jump was Champions of Magic? Yeah. So so Champions of Magic has been the biggest thrill of my life really um and a testament to the fact that you've been doing it so long you know yeah i mean the so so the story of champions of magic is um we met so it's all about one very important person and his name is alex jarrett and alex is the producer of champions of magic we met alex in at the edinburgh festival that very first year 2011 and he was a, he's very close friends with piff the magic dragon so you've got to bear in mind, this is 2011, right? So Piff hasn't had his big break. Uh, and Alex at this point is, I don't know exactly, but I would say Alex Jarrett is around 20 years old. And he meets me in Strange and he says, I'm thinking about putting together this magic show soon. Would you guys be interested in being in it? And so we were like, yeah. At the time, Sam and I would say yes to anything for 25 quid, you know, because we just wanted to perform. And anyway, nothing happened for a year or so. And, and then um, and then we got a call one day and he said, uh, I, I've booked to book some theatres and I want to do this show and it's called Champions of Magic and it's going to be an ensemble show, be lots, you know, lots of magicians in it. Do you want to do it? And he offered us £500 to do it. So at the time, there's me and Sam. There's also an, uh, an assistant. Uh, there's also a Luton van that we have to hire. And it's in Harrogate. <laughs> it's like, it's, there's going to be no money left at all afterwards. But we go and we have an absolutely brilliant, brilliant day. We go up there. And, and so what we didn't realise at the time was that at the time, Alec, Alex was doing lots of Champions of Magic shows. And there were lots of different acts in the shows. And there were lots of people who were, were in it. Uh, different illusion acts, different close-up magicians, mind readers, uh, and Alex was effectively, he was, he was auditioning. He was looking for acts. He wanted the show to go and do a proper tour of, of the UK. And he was planning to do it in the fall of 2014. And so he, um, he tried lots of different acts and uh, he offered the first tour to us. And we thought it was gonna be, I think it was 14 dates. And here I am in 2021 and I'm, we're still in the show to this day. And we it's just been the most fun i've ever had like touring all over uh we've been all over the uk several times and then the big thing that happened was in 2017 alex managed to get it sort of picked up in america and, and managed to get a few promoters interested in it and so everything went across to the states and We've performed over there in the biggest theatres we've done. I mean, literally the biggest theatre, the Microsoft Theatre in Los Angeles, 7,000 seats. We've played ice hockey arenas. Um, we've done really long runs in venues. Like we did a run in Toronto a couple of Christmases ago. We did like 42 shows in 17 days, which was one, one venue, just bang, 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 all these shows. And it's just it's just been absolutely incredible. And, and it's all down to Alex. If you, if you can attribute anything to us and, and our success we've had through that show, the fact we went and did Edinburgh, is it? The fact we went to Edinburgh and we put on a show and we met him there, we wouldn't have met him otherwise. And he came to our show and, you know, and, and kept in touch with us. That was why we are. And also, I, I will say this, it's also because we do illusions. It's not a lot of competition. And really isn't. If you want to be in the Illusionists or Champions of Magic or Impossible or any of these kind of shows and you're a close up magician, that's going to be tough. There's a lot of close up magicians out there and they're brilliant. And producers now also are under a huge amount of public pressure to put on a diverse cast. 
they so you might be the world's best close-up magician but you might not fit because a producer in our modern world has to have a female has to have someone with a diverse background it's just the world we live in and it's and it's correct and it's right and producers are under a lot of pressure to uh to make sure that their lineups look like that and that by the way that doesn't matter if you're a, a show like champions of magic with a cast of five or you're hamilton in the west end with a cast of 40 everybody is under this and i, and I will use the word pressure it, it is pressure people are under pressure to 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 cast diverse uh, cast and crew and 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 not it's not even just in the entertainment world it's boards of directors and everything we all know what's going on and it's and it's right and it's a positive thing and so my point is saying is that you might be the best close-up magician but you might not be you know you might not be the right diversity or or there might be someone else we've already got you know two white guys so we don't we can't have another white it's in that those these things are happening these conversations are happening and so but if you're an illusion act, you might be up against 10, 10 other acts, uh, you know, and then it's really going to come down to how, how, how good is the act? How much does it cost? That's very important. What, what are you prepared to do it for? Um, and so those those things become very important in terms of you being in a being in a show like that. And so I think that the reason we've stayed in the show is that we uh we were there at the beginning. We were we did it for bait. Alex wasn't stupid. He knew we basically did it for no money at the beginning, and then you know we've stuck with it and we've we've grown with the show. We we massively reinvest in our act to to a level that, if I'm being honest, like our accountant would probably go, "What are you doing?" You know, we we've made good money uh, from it over the last few years, and we've put that money back in the act. Like we just do. You know, like, we we love it, and so and every time we have an opportunity to go and it's always up a, up another notch you know like i remember in 2015 we bought an illusion for four thousand dollars well at the time that was a lot of money to us the illusion we put into the show in 2019 cost fifty thousand dollars it's about the same amount of making us bankrupt actually it puts in the red about the same amount it's just you know it's just kind of like well now we can do this exciting thing let's do it because we love it and everything so so we continue to grow, the show continues to grow, we continue to grow with the show. Alex is um, not only the producer and everyone's boss, he's, a, he's also now, he's, he's just, he's brilliant creatively, he has great ideas, he's the third wheel with me and Strange, he's very, he comes up with, you know the thing Craig, you'll know this, it's easier to come up with ideas for other people than it is yourself, right? And, and Alex is good at that, Alex sees something and sees, you two could do that, or you know, what about if you guys do this? And so the, the last illusion that we put in, the, the one that I just mentioned, the one we'd spent the most money on, um, that was absolutely the three of us. We, I remember we were sat having dinner and we were just chatting generally and it just, it just bounced around the three of us very quickly. And, and we all were just like, why, what's wrong with this idea? There must be something wrong with it. Like, why, why doesn't it work? And it was like, no, I think, I think it could work. And so... And, and it doesn't work and nothing there's by the way there's nothing wrong with that in the early days of young and strange i used to get a bit annoyed with strange that he would <laughs> we, we'd like get together for a brainstorming session and nothing really would happen and he strange would say i need i need a third person like i just it just smoked better about a third person i'd be like why can't we just do it and i that was me actually i was wrong there's nothing wrong with that if you are an act and you need a, a you know, you need an Andy Nyman in the room or an Alex Jarrett or a whoever, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. If that's the way that the work is the best work, then that's absolutely the way you should do it. You should leave your ego at the door. And when I had a problem with it, that was absolutely my ego wanting to go, we can do this without us. Well, no, actually, we probably could do something, but it is always better. It's a balance, though. You don't want you don't want 50 people in the room. You know, it's got to be it's got to be a circle of people that you trust. And that's also some great advice I was given and, and I'll share it, which was when you start performing as a stage act, it is very, very um, tempting to ask every single person what they thought. And you will very quickly, that conversation will turn into what didn't you like because you want to improve. And what happens if you do that too much? It happens particularly if you do the Edinburgh Festival because you'll end up where you're every day there will be someone in your audience, a friend of yours, a family member, a magician you respect, 
And so it's very tempting to start asking everybody, what did you think? What didn't you like? What do you think we could do better? And that is bad. You end up with a very confusing picture. Uh, you know, you just, you, you're not sure what to do. One person will like one thing, one another person, you know, will point out something else. Then someone else will say they did like that. And you just end up very confused by it. So find people to collaborate with, uh, but also keep keep the circle fairly small. That would be my advice. I mean, that's for anybody listening. This this is a masterclass in how to how to catapult your career. It really is. So for anybody who's watching this, that wants to be doing what you're doing, they want to tour the world. They want to they want to play to the biggest stages. It's really about taking risks, putting yourself out there. Yeah. And, and 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 no, you know, no risk, no reward kind of thing, right? Exactly that. And but also like here's what I'd say to you is that if you want to be in a big touring show going around America, it's a possibility. There's also a very high possibility it will never happen for you because it, you could be brilliant. It's just the timing could be wrong. Okay. Like there has to be a show, first of all, going around America that have luckily you can get a job in. But here's what I'll say to you. You will have a great time even if you never get there. I can honestly say I had a great time at the Edinburgh Festival in 2011. And I probably had just as much fun at the first Champions of Magic show in Harrogate in 2013 as I did at our last one, which was in Canada at a place called Casino Rama. And we did a show in front of 4,000 people. It's, you, you know, it's the old cliche, it's the journey, not the destination. And if you want to be an illusionist, you can be an illusionist. You know, you can do it. You can, absolutely. You'll, you'll find somewhere to perform. It might be, you know, it might be holiday camps or cruise ships or, you know, there are options. There's not many, but you, if you really want to do it, you'll find somewhere to do it. And yes, there is an initial investment. You're going to have to save some money and buy, buy an illusion. And you'll probably buy, as we all did, you know, we all buy initially a piece of junk a lot of the time. I bought an origami illusion, it's a bit different. I was an idiot though. But most of the time, you know, the, the next illusion I bought after that was 350 quid. Um, and, and for years, you know, everything was fairly low in budget. I, I had an amazing piece of luck, which was, there's a magician in the UK uh, who I think he's probably the best magician all rounder. His name's Philip Hitchcock. He's amazing. Philip uh, had a Dove Act for many years. He did FISM and, and then he worked for, on cruise ships. He's done pantomimes and he's an amazing illusion builder. I don't think mean he does it so much anymore, um, but I, Philip Hitchcock was the first lecture I ever saw, believe it or not. Well, I mentioned at the beginning of going to junior day. In 1995, Philip Hitchcock lectured at junior day and he lectured on his Dove Act. And, in addition to the talking about the way the doves appeared, he also lectured about his birdcage vanish. He had a, and, and it's an illusion, okay? It's a birdcage that vanishes. And Phil, it was, a, it was a very entertaining lecture because Phil went through the process of all the different versions of it. And the gag was that he had a version and he said, this was the first version I made. It was this, this and that, but it wasn't quite right. So I made a new version. Would you like to see it? And he'd go into the wing and he'd bring another one on. And he'd say, this one was better, but still not quite right. So I made another version. Would you like to see it? And the gag was about 15 minutes later, he had about 20 of these bird cages around him. The whole stage was full of them. And he ends up with this great version. And I'd never forgotten it. And it, I, I managed to acquire a video of it years later from the Reading uh, Magic Club. They'd recorded it and watched it. And I was like, this guy is amazing. And Phil, I, I got in touch with Phil and... Um, I said about, you know, you made all the bird cages and I, and I had, a, there was a couple of, a couple of small illusion projects, which I had in mind and Phil built them for me. And he is an incredible builder. Like he is, he, he is amazing at welding aluminium. He is amazing at problem solving. He knows how to make illusions look deceptive, if you know what I mean. And he's just brilliant. And so Phil was a real piece of luck that we had because actually one of the problems if you get into illusions in this country is that 
there are a few exceptions, but a lot of the top builders and the guys that make the really stunning looking props, they're in Vegas or they're in America and it costs a huge amount to get the stuff over. When you get it over, you have to pay huge amounts of shipping and then also you'll get nailed for import duty and suddenly a 5,000 pound prop has become 10,000 pound. So having Philip in the UK and he was able to make those first few projects for us. And actually one of the illusions is still in Champions of Magic to this day uh, was a real, real kind of a piece of luck, really. Uh, Phil, Phil was is genuinely, you know, one of my magical heroes. Like he's just to me, he's the complete package because he's, you know, it's it's similar. It's a similar story actually to Scott Penrose, where Scott is to me is the complete magician. Scott had a bird act. Scott can do illusions. Scott can is a, you know very knowledgeable magic history. Scott can also. Uh, build incredible props. Phil is very similar, the, ticks all the same boxes, slightly different. You know, he, he's performed also on cru cruise ships and does pantos and things. But so he, he was a real gem and he was a hugely important part of our story in the early days. Wow. Absolutely wow. I mean, does it frustrate you sometimes that you've spent literally hundreds of thousands of pounds on illusions? And one of the things that you're most well known for is literally a cardboard box. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. Yeah, we do the cardboard box. And um, one of the things with the cardboard box is that I think I think it's probably the best thing we do. It's, it's subjective. It's my opinion. And the reason is the cardboard box, what's beautiful about it is that you can. So if you don't know what I'm referring to, it's the illusion where someone goes in a cardboard box. And when we do it, it's me. I go in the cardboard box and uh, spears, wooden spears are placed through the cardboard box at extremely yeah, high speed by say right now i have never seen anyone do it like you guys it genuinely looks like sam is about to take your head off like it's, <laughs> I, I have to look away every time i've seen you perform it because it scares me to death we put a lot of work into it it is it is genuine genuinely a bit, a bit dangerous um uh but one of the beauties of it i think one of the reasons why it, we we do it quite well now is that we it's an illusion you can just keep working on it's never finished and because um it's choreography you can change slightly the placement of a stick to make it look a little bit better you can change the speed you can add in gags you can do various things when you're in the box you can do a costume change you could come out eating a pizza you know we've tried everything and uh, we've done it you know we've all bits of business we've had tried all different music We've had it where supposedly I'm in the box. You hear a phone call over the PA system of me phoning for the pizza. We tried, we tried everything, um, and so it's quite interesting. Yeah, it doesn't annoy me. I, I, if anything, sometimes, particularly when you're in Champions of Magic, we are the illusionists. So although Sam and I actually are very versatile magicians, you know, Sam even more so than me actually. Sam's brilliant at card manipulation. He's also a brilliant close-up magician. But in Champions of Magic, we are the illusionists, so we don't get to display those skills. So people seeing Champions of Magic who are a bit sceptical or a bit jaded by magic will go, oh, all those guys do. They just, you know, they just point at boxes and they just do the big boxes. Um, so we don't really get a chance to do the other stuff. The, the, the card, what's beautiful about the cardboard box is actually someone who is fairly intelligent. They know what's going on and they, and they know it's highly skilled. And it's, you know, a bit dangerous and all those things. So it is the one thing we do in Champions of Magic for someone who is a bit more cynical, where it shows, it shows work. It shows, you know, people, people can see he's really in that box and that is genuinely dangerous and stuff. So, so it does, it does tick that box for us as well. I will say, by the way, just briefly, the, the people who think those things, by the way, that illusionists just point at boxes, the people who say that, they've never done it. Close-up magicians. Normally close-up magicians that say that. Yes, they've never done it. And they think it's easy. I can tell you, this is my experience, and Craig will tell you this as well, I'm sure. Uh, I, I personally have never done manipulation, so I will remove that. But of all the other types of magic that I've dabbled with, and I've dabbled with them all, um, other than manipulation, uh, illusions are the most difficult. And Paul Daniels said the same thing as well. It is, there's just so much more to it. It's, it's really complicated. There's engineering to consider. There's music, there's lighting, there's timing issues. There's multiple people involved. It is just more difficult. I will passionately argue that with anybody. 
um, that it is the most difficult form of magic to make good. It doesn't necessarily mean that the public will enjoy it more. They don't. They, they don't. I can be honest and say that as an illusionist, that mentalism connects more with an audience than, than illusions do. But it, but it, um, it is the most, in my opinion, it is the most difficult form of magic to do and to get good at. Because... You know what else it's really difficult is uh, stamping your own personality onto an illusion. Because with a close-up trick, you can go in so many different directions. Well, I'm not going to do a double lift. I'm going to do a top change instead. And I'm going to go in this direction instead. With, a, with an illusion, you get a box. And the instructions are very simple. Girl goes in the box or whatever. Something happens. And then something else happens. And then that's it, the end of the illusion. There's not like a download that comes at it comes with instructions and further thoughts i remember the first time i bought an illusion for myself it was from guy barrett and he delivered it over to me and i didn't even, it didn't even come with a look i didn't know how to do it i had to ring up guy and say how does it work i mean he just assumes you know and you've managed to stamp you and sam have managed to do which something that most illusion acts don't do which is you've stamped your own uh, your own personality onto the act and you've branded it you can tell a young and strange illusion because it's so different to what everyone else does. Uh, that's really kind of you say. It, it, it's not difficult though, what we did, which was we just didn't try to be cool and we acknowledge what they are, which is that they are strange looking things. They don't really make a lot of sense. They're like, it's just, it's ridiculous. Like the, the whole concept in this era of, Sam putting me in a box and, and putting spears through at high speed or putting me into another box and crushing me down to six inches long or, you know, it's, it, it, it's just ridiculous. And so if it's ridiculous, guess what that means? It means it can be fun. And yeah. that's all it is. And so that's all we've ever tried to do with it is just make it bright, colourful, fun and for there to be a lot of energy in the room. And, that, and that's the thing that like, yeah, I was a huge Copperfield fan. You know, David didn't try to do that, actually. David tried to connect with, and he, and he succeeded, you know, he tried to emotionally connect with an audience through his illusions. He tried to, you know, whether it was through, you know, the idea of human flight or, I mean, the name of his Broadway show, Dreams and Nightmares, you know, that was his take on it. And he was imitated more than anyone. And everyone who tried to imitate him, oh, I really mean this, failed. They never did it better than he did. And so we wouldn't succeed at that either. <laughs> you know, we, we just wouldn't. And so we go, well, what can we do? And, you know, Hans Clock's a huge influence on us. Hans is so smart, like, and he sees it as well. He gets it. Like, it's not a mistake. There's not, it's not an accident the way he's dressed or what his hair's like, or the fact he has a wind machine blowing his hair. He knows exactly what he is. And it's just meant to be exciting. And that's what, and if you go and see a Hans Clock show, and I've been to the West End to watch Hans Clock, and I've also travelled to Amsterdam to see Hans Clock perform for his own fans in, in you know, in his hometown. Yes, that he's nailed it. Like that's what it is to him, you know. And there's others that 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 do it in different different ways, you know. But those those two acts, Copperfield and Hans Clock, to me, they're the ones when I look at. Like if you want me to name some illusionists who really got and really understood the way they were doing it. Yeah. It's those two. They just, and so that's what we aspire to be. There is, a, there is something that um, we're not good at. In fact, we've wasted years with this problem, and I'll share it because it's not clever of us. For a long time, we would look at an illusion and go, is that right for us? Would we do that? It's absolutely wrong. I wish we'd never, ever entertained that thought process actually what you should be saying to yourself is how would we do that that's the right way to look at any piece of material and paul daniels was on tv for 17 years and did hundreds of tv shows and you know craig he did everything he did everything yeah. he did you know he did everything close up mind reading illusions escapes he did it all and the reason he was able to do it is because he just looked at it and went how would i do this so that's something I would say to you again, I wish I'd known and, and beat that out of me years ago because I, I really feel we wasted opportunities when I look back now where we would look at stuff and go, yeah, we, we you know, that's not right for us. That's wrong. The right thing would have been to say, well, how would we do that? that? That's a better way of looking at it. If only you could bottle hindsight, right? 
Yes, absolutely. But, you know, we talked about risk earlier on and taking risks. Let's be honest, Richard, there's nothing more risky than uh, pushing an illusion out into the middle of a field during a live tele news telecast and hijacking the, uh, you know, hijacking the newscast. That was a ballsy move. Like, and, and for those people that don't know what I'm talking about, this was this is one of the biggest viral videos in magic. And you and Sam engineered that whole thing, and it was incredible. Where did that come from? Well, that was, it was, it's really, it, I don't have fond memories of that project, actually. Everybody, everybody was talking about it, though. Like, everybody. Like, yeah, it, not, just, not just, not to be clear, not just magicians. I remember when you did that, I had, like, three gigs back to back the following day an illusion show and two close up over the course of two or three days all people could talk about was that like that's all anyone could talk about yeah it, it was it uh, I, I you know it's the one and only time in my life i went viral so you know i it was it was it was weird actually it was my birthday as well it's really really strange coincidence i woke up on my birthday you expect to have hopefully at least a message from your mum right saying happy birthday and I worked and I'd never seen anything like it. My phone was just like, you know, you see these videos online when a, an influencer posts something and it goes crazy. I just, oh, what has happened? And um, yeah, it just happened overnight, basically. The story of it's quite interesting. I don't, like, so I don't have fond memories of it. It was very stressful. Um, so obviously we were doing live shows and and there was kind of this thought that we should, should we be trying to do more sort of video content online and stuff but it didn't enthuse, enthuse Sam and I really we just wanted to be on stage you know but Rob James is a great friend of ours he he had some brilliant ideas for us in terms to places that we could things we could do and so he kind of pitched a few things he said you know it's you it's you two being idiots basically doing illusions in inappropriate places and so the first one we made was just us going into a shopping centre in Swindon and we got thrown out and it's, it's funny and it, it did all right. You know, we got like, I don't know, we got like you know, 30, 40,000 views. You know, we did well. I think the people of Swindon shared it because it was in their shopping centre in Swindon. And then, so what happened? So, so the, the, the Sky News uh, video bomb is fake. That's the, that's the big thing. We staged it entirely. And it's I part of know that. Oh, you didn't know that. Yeah. It's, it's not real. So, it's part of a longer video. And so the longer video is the format again, which was a collaboration between me, Rob James and Sam Strange and another guy called Dave Mackey who was like the director, camera operator. We all sort of worked together. And the idea of it was that Young and Strange are gonna try and get a TV show. And of course, Young and Strange are gonna try and do that in an unorthodox way. So the longer video is basically us walking in, literally just walking into the BBC lobby and going up to the receptionist and going, uh, hi, uh, yeah, we're young and strange. Uh, we've decided we're going to have a TV show. Good news for you. We've decided we're going to go with BBC One. Who do we need to speak to? And so it was stupid, right? And it was, and that was legit. That was done absolutely, you know, secret cameras. The receptionist just like, look at us like, what the, you know, and it's funny. And so they threw us out video cut next we're in ITV hi we're young and strange we've decided we're gonna have a tv show it's good news for you we've decided we're gonna go with ITV one who do we need to speak to and so of course they throw us out the ending to the video was how would young and strange achieve this goal in an unorthodox way considering that they have failed and what they would do is they would video bomb someone and so where's the place to do it well where you know there's going to be news broadcasters which is down at the House of Parliament. So the reason it was possible and it was a perfect logical ending to the video was that for an unrelated uh, gig, I had met Ashish Joshi, who is the Sky News uh, anchor. He's a lovely guy and he loves magic. He talked to me for, at length when I met him about his excitement when he met Dynamo before he was famous and they did a little thing together. And so, I contacted Ashish and said, look, so we've got this idea, um, it's fun. Uh, could we hire you for the day to make this like video? It's the end of this video. And so he was, you know, he's, a, he's an amazing guy. And he was like, oh guys, you don't need to pay me. Like, I'll just come down. I'm always down there anyway. Like, just, just let me know when. So we go down and we film it. So on the day of the filming, Ashish is a little bit 
he's not relaxed, I guess is the best way I can say it. So I'm like, everything all right, mate? And he's like, what, what are we doing again? And I said, well, you're going to read to camera. I said, and then we're going to be doing the trick in the background. And he was like, so what are you, you are definitely doing the trick, right? You're not like, you know, doing anything you're not telling me about, or you haven't like, you're not tripping me up. I'm like, of course not. Like we're doing, I said, well, what's, what's your worry? You know, I want to make you relaxed here. He said, I forgot to tell my bosses I'm doing this. I'm like, oh, okay. He said, well, I said, listen, it's only going to go on the internet. I said, it's probably, you know, it will get a few thousand views. Like, so he said, okay, fine. So we did it. So here's the thing that happened. The video, the full video went out on YouTube and it did okay. I don't genuinely don't remember now because it was a few years ago, but we, the decision was made to put just the Sky News clip by itself as a separate video. You know how people chop videos up, you know? And so that's what we did. We put the Sky, just the Sky News clip by itself on to YouTube. And for a couple of weeks, it sat there and nothing happened. And then one night, bang, it went viral. It got shared on Reddit and, and you know, you know the process of what happens. And so that's the morning of my birthday. I wake up and one of the proudest things in my career, if anyone says, what's the proudest moment of your career? I'll tell you, it's that we made Sky News tweet that the video was not genuine. So Sky News tweeted on that morning, the video, I've still got a screen grab of it somewhere. The video doing the rounds of the magicians in the background of our broadcast is not genuine. And so that was a really proud moment. Now, unfortunately, this is what happened. About 7 a.m., it arrives in the offices of Sky News. They don't know when it happened because we recreated the graphics and it is Ashish, their guy. They believed it too. They believed it. And so then as the morning goes on, people are ringing, you know, it got picked up by Time Magazine, the Daily Mail, the Sun, the Mirror, the Star, like it was going everywhere. Like, and so people started ringing Sky News asking for the footage and they were very embarrassed that they didn't know when it had happened. Ashish is on vacation in Portugal. They ring him and they say, this is really embarrassing. Like, this thing happened. When did it happen? When were you outside the House of Parliament? When did, how did we miss this? And so Ashish says, ah, uh, that's not genuine. They're like two mates of mine. And we just did it for like a bit of a laugh. So now he, he now he's in trouble. And so then he calls me and he's like, I need to tweet that this video is not genuine. I'm under a lot of pressure. But he's such a great guy. He said, I can buy you two hours. I'll do it in two hours. Hopefully by then it's gone even more viral. And so, so he did. And so uh, he didn't tweet for a couple of hours. Sky News did. But then, but so, so what happened then was it got a double hit. It got the first thing and then it got follow-up articles. People going, oh, it's, it's, a, it's all a big scam. Like it's, you know, it's not real. And this guy is now in trouble and all this kind of stuff. So it was, it was, so, I mean, look, I can't, we never planned any of that. Like we just made a video and all these things have, the reason I have bad memories of it is there's two, two reasons I have bad memories of, the, of it is that um, Rob James was a, is one of my best friends in the whole world. Uh, we, we sort of fell out with him over it. There was, it was just a, uh, he was such an important part of the collaboration and he felt that we hadn't credited him enough. Um, so that was difficult. It's also weirdly Rob's birthday is the same birthday as mine. So this was happening on the same, it was also Rob's birthday and Rob wasn't happy. The second reason is that Ashish contacted me and was like, you need to make this go away. It's causing me a lot of problems in my work um, because it just kept coming back every few weeks. Another, another, you know, it did, it did the rounds. It went to all these kind of rude tube shows and stuff like that. And, and so it kept coming back to bother him and he had to keep re- explain he had to keep explaining to people again and again that like he it was a it was a thing I did with some friends and he, he, he's a he's a top journalist like you know he didn't want that in his life so so it's just those two things really that for me every, whenever it comes up now whenever I think I 
I have bad feelings about it. I remember that two people who I really, really like, and in Rob's case, I really care for, uh, you know, were became upset with it. So, but that's you know, we we learn, don't we? So that was that was that was the process of it. It was it was it did it did did amazing things for Strange and I. Actually, the the most important thing it did. We at the time we were trying to get management. We we were desperately trying to you know become like as we saw it, it was quite an important part was to get representation so it just makes you look like you're a proper act and um there was there's a our management company they're, they're based in in london called money management and uh on the morning we, we were kind of already talking to them um and i won't bore you with it but there was a there was a project going on that i was working on by myself uh, it was unrelated to young and strange and they kind of were kind of they weren't sold on young and strange like they didn't want us on their books and then that happened and that was like the, the guy who runs it francis and dana um they you know were like okay yeah you got you got our attention we'll sign you up so so that was nice and and there was a few other things as well you know it was shown lots of places and uh yeah but it didn't i will say it didn't make us famous it didn't have our name attached to it it just looked like a Two magicians. It was two magicians. It wasn't. It wasn't young and strange. It was. So that's an important thing if you're going to try and make something viral. Make sure your name's in the title. That's how you get well known. It just became video about two magicians on Sky News. Uh, but yeah, no, it's was, it was, it was all part of the adventure. Well, here's a question. You you've you've achieved so much success. You are now at a position where you've got a management company you're you've been doing champions of magic for years and years and years you are by any definition of the term success very successful why do you then decide to go and start a podcast when you're so busy doing everything else you and, and by the way when i say start a podcast it becomes the podcast in the magic world not just the uk community in the magic world and i want to talk about the podcast but I think we need to start with why. Yeah, it's really interesting. The, the, I think personally, the podcast, in, in my opinion, is is the best work I've I've ever done. Um, I certainly get told that from time to time by magicians, which is which is nice. Uh, you say I was really busy. I wasn't really. Like I do a few gigs at the weekend. Strange, I would get together occasionally and work on something we do, but there was a. There was a lot of spare time actually as a as a full-time magician there just was there was a lot of spare time and i really loved pete wardell's uh project which he he had done which was called the magic state of mind where he interviewed magicians and then there was a, a comedian called Stuart goldsmith he started a podcast called the comedians comedian podcast and he um i just loved them and i i again it's rob james i remember being on the phone to rob and i said i wish there was something magic like this and Rob, I'll never forget it, Rob's words, he said, the only reason there isn't is because you haven't started it yet. He said, why don't you buy a microphone and go and interview someone? So I did, bought a microphone and watched a few videos on YouTube about how you edit audio and just went. And, and I remember the first person was Paul Martin and he was, you know, great. And he went, yeah, of course I'll do it. So I went to his house and... Um, interviewed him and I mean, never could have again it, it, it's, it's the same as champions of magic it's the same as that video going viral i never could have known where it would go you know I, I i won't claim to be some sort of like i had this big plan i didn't it just i genuinely enjoyed doing it uh i i it felt productive that was very important to me my life was missing that actually you know doing close-up jobs when the gig's over the gig's over you're just back to square one you go to another gig and you start again um young and strange was making progress but it was slow and so this thing of remember rob saying you know the way that this will build an audience is you have to put an episode out every week on time that way it will become part of people's lives it will become part of their routine just like now uh almost every day no every day i am looking on your YouTube channel to see what the new video is, right? It is, it's become part of my routine and you know that and that's why you post so many brilliant videos. And so, you know, because it gets into people's lives it becomes part of their routine. So that's what I did. And, you know, when in the first season, I just, but I, that was the satisfaction I got from it actually. It was feeling productive, feeling like I was doing something 
Uh, I had a deadline to meet every Friday, would go out every Friday. Um, and it was a lot of work. I did not realize, I was very naive in terms of just how much time, I, mean, I cannot imagine how much time you're putting into this YouTube channel. Like the fact you're putting multiple videos out a day, I can't get my head around at all when you're having to edit and post it and do everything else that goes with it. Um, so yeah, it was just, it was fun. I enjoyed it. And in the first season, I just sort of interviewed my friends really. And a few magicians I'd met from time to time or once or twice. And I remember like what a thrill it was to go to Nick Einhorn's house. Like for the last episode of the first season, I was Nick's a genuinely like hero of mine and like, you know, close up magic. I sort of always considered him the measuring stick really. And he was so nice to me, like invited me into his home and and he's got the most beautiful home. And I remember just going like, wow, like this is, you know, this is this is the top guy, like this is where I live. And he's invited me into his house. So I felt really privileged. And so it just went from there. It was just a gradual thing. And I think it's fair to say that by the time I got about halfway through the second series, I thought, I wonder if one day I'll be able to get David Copperfield. And so that became the thing. And I, I knew that would never just happen. In order for it to get there, it had to go on a journey and it had to build and it had to have interesting people on it. And dare I say it, you know, I can say it now and he wouldn't be offended if he heard this. Absolutely, I made some episodes that I knew he would love to listen to, mm. you know? And, he, and, and actually, before I interviewed him, but one of the first few times I spoke to him, he said to me he'd listened to the Paul Keeve episode. He was a good, he, they're great friends, you know? And so I was like, oh, interesting. Like, you know, that was absolutely part of the plan. So that's the only part, that's the only bit that, again, I wouldn't say was planned, but was definitely a hope was that, oh, I might, if I keep working at this and it keeps building, I might be able to get a field. It's the same way I got Darren. And Darren is, you know, he's a, also an absolute hero of mine was to get Darren, I realized if I told Darren's story through other amazing people, that Darren might want to come on eventually and tell his story, tell his side of things. So I had Sharky and Long, I had Anthony Owen, I had Andrew Connor, I had Michael Vine, you know, his managers, his collaborators, like, um, and, you know, I had these guys on and I thought, well, maybe, you know, Nyman as well, of course, part of that picture, maybe Darren will want to, I never, I never saw interviewing Andy, actually, if I'm being completely honest, I, 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 maybe I'm unusual, but I don't personally, I don't find the Darren stuff the most interesting part of Andy. Uh, Andy's, to me, this is only my personal subjective opinion, but I, I find other elements of Andy's life and work more interesting than the Darren stuff. Um, and so, yeah, so that was, that was all part of it. And so, yeah, I did, you know, I got these guys and I think I did a reasonable job and I remember it was very important that the, I tried to get Darren and the reason Darren agreed to do it is because Andrew O'Connor said, do it. That was it. And, and you asked so many amazing questions. I remember sitting there thinking, if I was doing this, these are the sort of questions that I'd ask. This is, you know, it was, it was just, it was just fascinating listening to. In fact, I interviewed Wayne Dobson. It's not gone up on the channel yet, but I interviewed Wayne Dobson a couple of weeks ago. And I asked him the question, I said, everything that you've achieved, you know, what's one of the highlights? And he actually said, being interviewed by you. And he told a story about you coming to his house and being fooled over and over again by Lucky Card and saying oh how, God. you know, and he said, he said that was, that was just wonderful to see. And you know, I, I don't know if you can see it, but Lucky Card is on that shelf there. Like, <laughs> oh my, I mean, I loved that so much. Yeah. Wayne, Wayne is just great. And I don't know if he told you, I broke down on the way. It was the, it was the only podcast I never made it to. I oh, broke down. Okay. Yeah. So the first time, bless, bless him. He was so, again, so kind. I was mortified, but I broke down on the way to his house and never made it that on the day we'd arranged. And I was just like, and I remember he was with Mike Sullivan and I, and I insisted that we video called and that I proved that I broke down and I wasn't making out. I was by the side of a road for a flat tire. And, uh, and uh, it was worse than that. Actually the clutch had gone. I think it was, yeah, it wasn't a flat tire. The clutch had gone, but yeah, it was, uh, oh yeah. But then when we, I went there that day to interview Wayne and he just, I don't know how it even came about. I don't know if he planned it, maybe he did, but 
He did lucky card on me. I don't know what I was expecting. But if you'd have put a gun to my head after he did it and said, how did he do it? I would not have had, I would have been dead. I would not have been able, I had no possible idea, not a clue. Because the beauty of Wayne, Wayne's material, um, bless his heart, unfortunately due to necessity, is that it's all hands off. Yeah. So everything you know is, is out the window. There's no palm, there's no stack, there's, there's nothing. And so he sat there in his wheelchair and did a miracle for me. Like it was, and I, I, it affected me. I remember that so strong. And when, when they explained to me how it was done, I was even more impressed. Um, and I've done that trick for so many people. I do it. I do it whenever I can. And because it's also, if you don't know Lucky Card, it's an exciting trick to do. You don't know how it's going to go. When you, I won't give too much away, but you don't, you, you, you've got some work to do as a magician and you, you don't know how it's going to go and it can go brilliantly. It, and, and most of the time it does. And uh, maybe I'm saying too much, so I'll shut up, but I love the process of performing it as well. It's, it's such a fun trick to do. And I've tried to convince uh, Alex, uh, the producer, Champs of Magic, when, we, when we're in the States, it's very, uh, very frequent that the way that, press works in America when you're promoting your show is that you go in in the morning on the morning of the show you go onto the morning news so everybody does the, every city in, Amer in America has got a local news station they've, sometimes they've got several and so it's very easy to get a spot on those news channels you give them a call you say we're at the theatre tonight can we come in and just let everybody know and they'll go yep you have four minutes at 7am or something ridiculous and so I've always wanted to do Lucky Card on the presenter, but Alex is like, no, we have one chance to promote the show. <laughs> like, I'm not taking a risk that it might not go as perfectly as it normally does, or you screw it up. Because it is, it, you are a magician of, you're under, you, you know it, Craig, you're under a little bit of pressure, aren't you, when you do it? You are. It's the most fun trick to do. I love it. I will do it for the rest of my life. I promise it. And I've got it over there. And there's a reason it's, it's on that shelf it, right, right there is because I use it all the time. Yeah, uh, it really is. It really is amazing. But I have to ask you, why? I mean, you obviously halfway through season two thought, well, maybe I can get Copperfield. Why did you stop the podcast? Was it because you couldn't go any further? Because honestly, I told you this off camera and this is true. When 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 you stopped the podcast, I was probably as upset about that as I was about the Spice Girls splitting up when I was a kid. <laughs> I, I, it was the same. It was the same mental anguish for me. It was terrible. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, I just, I just felt it was the end of the story. I really did. And and, it, and I'm not going to lie. There were times where I was tempted to bring it back, and and maybe one day I'll do something similar or something. But it's just, it. He was. He's. He's my guy. He's my hero. He's my idol. I, I saw him when I was ten. You know, I, I watched him over and over and over again to sit with him that evening in Las Vegas in his museum and to look him in the eye. First of all, to be able to tell him how much he meant to me was was really it was a really important moment in my life, actually. And he's had that a lot. He's had a lot of people tell him that. So he's good at dealing with it. He doesn't it doesn't make me feel weird or anything. He's very good at just thanks. You know, I'm really pleased to hear that sort of thing. But to sit with him that night, I, I I could not see a way I could go anywhere after that, really. It was going to, maybe it could have gone on some sort of different journey. But also, there, you know, I it was tough. Really, it was, there was a temptation to go, actually, you know what, maybe I should finish it at the top. You know, maybe it will go, maybe people. There was certainly, I was its biggest critic because I would record the interview. I would then edit the interview. And then often I would listen to the episode one more time when it would go out as well. I could hear the repetition in my questions. I could hear the same anecdotes coming up over and over again, because ultimately we are all magicians. We all have similar viewpoints, particularly at a certain level, like we have similar stories. So there was, you know, I know, I know a lot of people weren't listening every week, but there were definitely some people who were. And I, and I did think no one's going to say it to me, but people must be hearing this like I am and, and hearing the same stuff come up over and over again. And um, so, yeah, to, to me, it was such a, it was, it was such an adventure to try and get him to do it. And so when he finally agreed, I just thought, this is the end, isn't it? It's just the end. Like, I can't go anywhere from here. I really missed it. 
I felt very lost afterwards and in the, in the way lots of people do in our business when a project ends, I, you know, I really, I, I wasn't sure what was next. Um, I was also looking now, I, I was a very early, early adopter to podcasting, not, not like groundbreaking, but I started it in 2014 and this podcast starting now, you know, like, and, and so I, the thing, the thing that I didn't expect genuinely meant a lot to me was like people really loved it oh yeah i didn't like there 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 were some proper fans of the podcast there were lots of people who just tuned in occasionally and enjoyed it and they're sure there were some people who didn't like it but they, they, they i really that really shocked me that i found a proper fan base like of people who would quote things to me and would send me gifts and they would you know I, I, that to, I, that was very unexpected. All of that, and it was it was very very flattering. And I, you know what? Like, what's beautiful about the internet is that there are people still discovering them now. They're all on YouTube. They're there for posterity. That's a Mark Kirstein tip. I said to Mark, "What is the best thing to do with these podcasts? So that if I am run down by a bus tomorrow, they will be there for as long as possible." And Mark said, "Put them on YouTube. That's the best place for them." So they're on YouTube, they're also on iTunes, they're on Podbean, and, and I will continue, I promise for the rest of my life, it costs £100 a year at the minute, I will continue to pay the money so that it can stay there. And, and it's interesting, you know, the more time goes by, the more important some of them are. You know, we, there's, there's 100 episodes, you know, we've lost Anthony, uh, we lost Paul Daniels, you know, and some of the guests that, that were on it are just naturally getting older. Um, and so some of it's some of it's quite not, not all of it. I won't be crazy or insane or d- delusional about it, but, but so I do believe I do believe some of it is quite important, actually, or will prove to be quite important down the road. Um, it was Ian Keeble that made me realise that he realised it before I did. Ian was like, some of this, some of what you're doing is quite important. The Paul Daniels interview, again, could never have been planned. That was six months before he died. As far as I'm aware, no one has ever corrected me. It's the last interview Paul gave to the magic community. He did other stuff, normal PR for shows he was doing stuff, but I don't think he did another in-depth interview like that after he did that one with me. You know, I checked actually, like he died when he was 77. In the interview, he says, I'm 77 now. Like he literally says it, like he didn't realize what he was saying at the time, but what he was saying was, you know, I'm in the final year of my life. And, and it's a two hour retrospective with him looking back over his, not just his time at the BBC, his entire life. He starts talking at the beginning about growing up and, and, and discovering magic while he was on holiday in a, in a book, you know, and, and goes all through the working men's clubs and everything. He was, he, was a, he was a treasure. I mean, he was polarizing, you know, he wasn't everybody's cup of tea, but I mean, to me he was, he was a treasure. I, I often think of him, and I look back at the last year, Rob James and I talk about this quite a lot ago. What would Paul Daniels have done during a pandemic? I would pay a lot of money to see it. He would have done something brilliant, wouldn't he? He would have, 100%. He'd have done, he'd have done I don't know what he'd done, virtual shows? or like that. He would have done something brilliant, like, because that was the man. Debbie talked about it, reminds you, Debbie. He had the most extraordinary work ethic. You know, he was always working, always thinking, he was always reading. He was, he was a treasure. I, I genuinely, Rob and I talk about this, and we, we, you know, when we're grown men, we, we, we say it, I'm not embarrassed to say it to each other, we genuinely miss him, miss him from the magic world. Because he was always doing something. Yeah. He was either being funny, entertaining, amazing, interesting, or absolutely infuriating. He was always doing, <laughs> he was always doing something, you know? He was I a treasure. I uh, getting a chance to interview him on the Wizard Poet Review with David Penn. And we went over to his home uh, to interview him. I remember him. you interviewed him in the shed, didn't you? Is that right? Yeah, we interviewed him in the shed, which was just crazy. Um, and uh, he, he'd he never met me before. I opened up the, uh, he opened up the door and he, he, he said, hey, I want to show you something. And he did the, uh, what's that thing where you blow and the telcom powder goes in your face? Oh. He was like, oh, let me show you something. Blowing this. Oh. And that was the first, that was the first <laughs> five minutes of meeting him. I was covered in telcom powder and it's like, oh, okay, fantastic. where we're we going now. But I mean, that's, that's the thing. I mean, uh, for me, 
doing these interviews is a piece of cake compared to you. I'm just doing them over Zoom. So it makes it so much easier. You were traveling around the world doing your interviews, you know. Yeah, it was really, really important to me that I don't, I don't know why. I was probably stupid, actually, but I, I, I don't know why it became important to me. It was done face to face. I said no to a few people who wanted to do it over Zoom and stuff. I just I, I don't know what it was. It was I wanted to connect with the person and I wanted to look them in the eye. And also there was a there was a there was an, a wonderful thing that happened that I didn't plan which was that you would genuinely get to spend a bit of time with them before or after. Um, I heard some amazing things after I turn off the microphone where people would open up um, and talk about stuff. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, I was particular that happened with a Copperfield interview, actually. He, when Chris Kenner said to me, oh, okay, yes, he'll do it finally after years of trying. Uh, he said, oh, can, can you just do it over Skype or something? Because I was in Vegas when they finally said yes, I was in Vegas, but I was going home the next day. And they said, oh, he can do it, but he doesn't have time today. And I said, well, I'm going home tomorrow. Is there no way today we can do it? Like I'm, I'm just across the street, like at the Luxor, like I'll do it in the middle of the night if you want. No, he doesn't have time. And then Chris Kenner said, oh, you know, can't you just do it on Skype? And I was like, no, like I want to look the guy in the eye. And so I flew home. And I, I, I remember actually it was Alex Jarrett. I rang Alex Jarrett and I said, they, oh, you're not going to believe this. Like they've said, he said it will do it, but they want to be over Skype or something. And Alex was like, just immediately, Alex went, just fly back. And I was like, well, it's a long way. And it, that'll cost a lot of money. He went, well, you won't regret it, will you? You get to sit with him and talk to him for a couple of hours, like your childhood hero. You're not going to regret that, are you? And I was like, oh yeah, it's obvious, isn't it? So I did, I went home and immediately booked a return trip for like a month later and that was that was the right thing to do you know like I said I, I no one can ever take that away from me that that night now I sat there with my childhood hero for two hours looked him in the eye I was able to ask him absolutely anything I wanted to and he and and you know what within a little while I think you know David's been interviewed millions of times but I think he, he clocked it like uh, this guy's actually going to ask some interesting things, some things I haven't been asked before, because I knew his work so well. You know, I'd studied it religiously when I was a kid. I loved it. So I, I knew all the obscure things and stuff. And I've subsequently with him done a few other interesting things. Um, I, I recently interviewed him again for the Magic Circles Unlocked event, the Soaring in Half event. Uh, that was done. That was done on Zoom, but that's because we're in the middle of a pandemic. And last year, this was really unexpected but I was chatting to Will Houston who is the editor of the Magic Circles magazine and we I'd done a few I'd, I'd written a few cover stories for Will just as a hobby to be honest I just enjoyed the process I'd interviewed Edward Hillsome and Andy Nyman and I said why have you never had Copperfield on the cover of the Magic Circular he's the, you know in my opinion the greatest of all time and Will just said well I, just, I don't think he would do it I think he's he's not attainable and I just said well what well, we might be now we're in the middle of a pandemic everyone's out of work they we all know David sat in his mansion in Vegas so I said I'll just I'll just reach out so I did I just emailed him and said do you want to do a cover interview and so anyway long story short subsequently I thought what would happen is like what we're doing now Craig I thought I would interview David over zoom and then I would just write it up and send it in David was completely hands-on he wanted to be fully involved and, and it was a collaboration. David and I wrote 11,000 words together and we, we looked back at 11 of his illusions in great detail, written for magicians. And he was so open. It was, some of it was, I mean, some, some of it genuinely, I, I couldn't, I can't believe him saying this, I pulled him back a bit and said, oh, don't, don't say that that's how you did it. <laughs> like, but he's, David's obviously, as anyone would be, he's very proud of some of his methods and some of his thought process. And, and so we wrote, and it ended up being over two months of the Magic Circular. It ran over August and September, 2020. And David's the first magician in history has been on the cover of the magazine for two months running. And Homer Luwag, his collaborator, created a beautiful uh, image that happens when you put the two magazines together, it creates one big image of David and all of his illusions in the background. And so we worked on that for, for weeks. And I reckon I spent probably 30 or 40 hours on the phone to David, like every day during the pandemic when he was, you know, 
understandably not sure you had suddenly had a lot of spare time in his hands so did I and so we just wrote these articles together and I'm really really proud of them uh it's you know and it, it's a lot it's 11,000 words like if you read it it takes nearly an hour to read it like if you read them both together but it's a really it was a it was a wonderful thing it was the first time I personally got to see the way David works the, the, the interview I'd done, it was just an interview, but the writing the articles, I got an insight into the way the man actually thinks and works. And that was what a privilege that was to see that. He is a very special guy. And also, again, just the work ethic. All these people at the top, they're not accidents. They work harder than anyone. He would often call me and say, right, okay, let's do another chapter. And I'd look at the time, work out, it was like 4 a.m. in Vegas. I'm like, so I would, I got fairly not, he's still my idol. So I'm still a little bit, you know, nervous around him, but I, I would go, you know, like, have you just woken up or you, you not been to bed yet? And he'd be like, Oh, I, you know, I, I wake up sometimes in the night and I'll do some work and then I'll, I'll go back to bed in a little bit. Like, wow. You know, that's how he works. And, and, and yeah, he's just like, he's just on and, just you know works really really hard and stuff so yeah it was it was it was an amazing privilege it's, it's you know the, the thing they say you should never meet your heroes like with with David like every time I have any sort of interaction with him he's always just uh, it's always just been an absolute pleasure delight he's just so impressive in every respect and he's also very he's very he's very kind he's very very warm he, he genuinely has some real modesty to him as well there have been times when I've had to go this was brilliant when you did this you know <laughs> and he'll be like really but like, he's not a fan of um his, his 1988 tv special the bermuda triangle uh he's not a fan of it at all he doesn't think it's very oh, i love it <laughs> it's like i just love it it's spectacular and it's like you know it's got some amazing illusion and, and so i'm like i'm the one going this is this was brilliant this thing on this what are you talking about like <laughs> Oh, I'm not sure I don't like it sort of thing. Yeah, he's a, he's a, he's again, he's a, he's a treasure. And, and the thing is, the success that you had with the podcast, interviewing David Copperfield and then collaborating with him later on, that all comes from putting yourself out there. You know, yeah. you couldn't have walked up to uh, David Copperfield and rocked up and said, uh, hi, I'd like to interview you for a podcast. It hasn't actually started yet, but uh, I'd like you on it. It's about putting in the work and putting yourself out there and not uh, being afraid of taking risks, really. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It, it, and you know what? I wish I was more, I wish I was braver, actually, particularly when I look back to my younger, you know, my early 20s and things. I think one of the things that I, I think I spoke to someone young recently who, who told me that they feel real pressure when they post something on social media. They're worried that it's not going to be well received. And I, I sort of understand that to an extent, but I think the younger generation really feel pressure about it and have anxiety about that issue I certainly wish I'd put I take a, I take an even more risks when I was younger and not been so shy to not everything you do has to be perfect you know David says this a lot you know dare to be bad sometimes you're bad but sometimes you'll be really good you'll get good at something so um yeah I think that uh that that process of being a little bit braver and putting yourself out there I, I've I'd recommend it. You, yeah, you'll get some critics, but those critics will normally be people who wish they were brave enough to do what you've done. Absolutely. 100%. And it's lovely that you've come full circle, that your childhood hero is somebody that you've now got a relationship with. Which brings us to the latest chapter in your life, because another childhood hero that we talked about right at the very beginning of the interview, uh, Bob Swaddling, you now work very, very closely with Bob. And you talked about how you used to go and see his stand and just be in awe of the guy. And now you and Bob are, you know, actively working together to reimagine some of his best releases. And it's amazing that you've done it again. You've gone and done it again, Richard. Oh, I really appreciate that, Craig. I love your enthusiasm for it. I know you reviewed Changing Cards last year and obviously I really appreciate your kind words about the, the Torn Restore card as well. Um, Bob's, Bob's amazing. And so he's, he's long retired now. Uh, he, he emigrated with Val and they live in Florida. So they used to live in Oxfordshire. They now live in Florida and they are enjoying their retirement. Their daughter lives nearby. 
with their grandchildren and everything. And so the days of them sitting and gluing playing cards are long gone. But there was no doubt to me that the changing card uh, was still brilliant. And Bob used to still make them for me because I used to do them in close-up gigs and I used them in Champions of Magic for a little while as well. I particularly always loved the lucky lady trick, which was the you know, where you'd show a complete poke hand with two cards. And um, so we talked about it. I, I would see Bob from time to time, obviously, you know, when I'd be over in the States and I mentioned it a couple of times. We should, well, whatever happens to that changing card, you know, why, why don't you get someone else to make them or any just kind of, so I oh, don't know, really, Stop, I'm retired, you know, it's just what it is. And so I said a couple of times, like, oh, we should, we should bring them back. And if I'm being completely honest, I think I thought we'd probably never find time to do it, you know? And then obviously the pandemic happened and it occurred to me, well, I've suddenly got an awful lot of time and I'm also out of work, <laughs> like, and, uh, you know, and I thought they're still brilliant. I can't see why people, I can't see that anything's happened where there's something amazingly new that's come along that's better or it's still, and, and in actual fact, I look at it and go, well, actually because of people doing virtual shows and social media, which wasn't a thing when Bob was, you know, around in the nineties, like these, this might be even more relevant than it's ever been. So I approached them again and said, look, you know, I, I've got all this time. I'd love to do it. Obviously, only if you're happy. And um, so we, we agreed a deal. And so I am the I am the manual labor. I, I, I have no intellectual in, input in this whatsoever. Uh, this the, the changing card and the torn restore card are the work of Bob Swaddling the Genius and also some recent upgrades and additions, uh, thanks to Harry de Cruz, who is a brilliant young uh, magician and he's uh, becoming a very well-respected consultant across the magic world he's working with all sorts of amazing people and so um so that was it basically and bob bob and i uh, did a deal and um it's everyone's happy and i i sit here and make them and they take a very long time to make and then the changing card did really, really well. And most importantly, Bob was happy with everything. Cause it's not just the product. It's also the tutorial, the, the marketing, the, the logo, you know, the, everything is important. And so all Bob did, I say all he did, he did everything. He, you know, he created the changing card and said, this is, this is what it is. And so we basically started again from scratch with all of the, you know, when you bought this, 25 years ago you got a little booklet that showed you how well that's not relevant now we have video tutorials and all of that and also I really wanted to bring it to a younger audience that was a really important part of it because I thought well first of all they haven't seen it before of course that means they might buy it secondly it's also the fact that they are you know they, they'll be excited by it hopefully and also I thought it'd be nice for Bob to see youngsters using his invention and so that's that's really what we sort of set, and that's why it looks very. Uh, hopefully, you will agree. It, everything about the, the the trailer, the website, everything is all meant to look very modern and very. But it's this. What's beautiful about it is that both of our, our two key effects, the changing card and the Tom Restore card, are older than you, most yeah. of the time. And uh, and so yeah, it's it's a pleasure. They are the changing card takes a long time to make. The Tom Restored card takes even longer and is a frustrating process and they don't all and you spend a lot of time on one i only am able to make about six or seven a day so i make them in i make them in sets of four i can do that twice a day and i normally put at least one or two in the bin because they're just not right and so yeah it's it's um it is it is what it is but so so far people seem to like them and i'll continue to make them as long as people want them uh, if I do ever get my life back and I go back on the road with Champions of Magic, they they might not, then possibly they may I may not be able to do it at that point. But hopefully we're trying to find a way that I'm effectively sat here every day. Also, with not not with Torn Restore card because people are still buying them quicker than I can make them. But but we're changing cards now because we have 25 different varieties. I'm trying to build a bit of a stock, 
And so there's been a lovely thing that's happened is I made an inquiry about potentially being at the, the Blackpool Magic Convention in 2022. Just thought it'd be interesting. I've never done anything like that before. Thought it could be, make it feel like a different Blackpool. And there's a waiting list to be a dealer at Blackpool, quite a long one that goes on for years. And so I asked if I could join the, the list and the organizers of the Blackpool Magic Convention came to me and once they realized what it was we were selling and Bob, as you know, Craig was a key part of Blackpool for many years, for many, many people. You've mentioned how his stand was the most exciting stand you would visit every year. I used to just go straight into Winter Gardens, go down into the dealer hall, turn left, and, and he was the first guy that I went to see. Yeah. Uh, every single time. And so Blackpool came to me and said, we are going to give you a dealer stand. And we thought it would be really, really lovely if you were in Bob's old, old spot. So that's where I'll be as long as everything goes to plan next year, 2022, that's where you'll be able to find changing cards. So, uh, yeah, it's really it does, like when I read it, I was actually a bit choked up by it. I was like, oh my God, that's so, that's so amazing. And so, yeah, Bob, Bob and Val obviously won't be there because they'll be still enjoying the sun in Florida, but I will uh, video call them at some point when, when we're there. That's my plan to show you, look where I am. So, yeah, it's all, it's all very lovely. Obviously, look, the pandemic is why... I'm doing this uh, but on a personal note is it though because you said that um you talked to bob about doing this two or three years ago unless you are a real mentalist and you could have predicted covid this is something that you had in your mind before the world went to shit like yeah, I did. I did have it in mind. I guess what I'm really saying is, if if I'd have continued to be very busy with Champions of Magic, and Champions of Magic has been getting busier and busier every year. I mean, I know in 2020 we had. I mean, it's so sad to think about, but Alex had nearly 40 weeks work booked that year. That's we were going to be basically on the road the whole year, and um, it all just got the plug got pulled. And I mean. So yeah, I don't know if we'd have ever, it was definitely in my mind, yes. And I obviously hope to do it, but I wasn't, I'm not sure if I would have ever found the time. So this is the, for me, this is the, the, the two great things that came out of the pandemic for me personally is writing those articles with David. That was just a, just a, such a joy. And, and then also changing cards like, and, and working with Bob and we really, what was also lovely, we just properly reconnected, you know, and, uh, you know, he's my childhood mentor. So for me, they're the two things where, you know, we've all had a terrible time and it's been really tough. We've all had to make huge adjustments in our lives. And I've, I'm not em embarrassed to say, like, I, at times, I've really struggled over the last year. The, the change from, you know, I was on the road with Champions of Magic from October 2019, nonstop until the end of February 2020. I was on a five, six month tour. We thought we had three weeks off because the show was going from Canada down to Mexico. It's going across two borders. The customs at Mexico is a nightmare. So there was three weeks off and I thought I was coming home for three weeks. I hadn't been in England since the end of September. I thought I was coming home for three weeks to see my parents and my friends and have a bit of a break. And we never went back. Um, so it was, it was like, it was really, really tough that every, all of us had to make an adjustment, but being on tour, it's just a hundred miles an hour. Life is so, it's just, it's just every day, there's just something going on. There's some adventure, some problem to go from that to being a few weeks later, I was sat in my house by myself looking around going, what has happened? How long is this going to last? You know, I can be honest and say, personally, I, I found it really, really tough. And I'm not embarrassed about that. I'm really not, I, it's, it's obvious. You know, and and it was. I think it was, every magician has gone through something similar. It's. And the thing we must all remember, and this has really helped me. I don't know who said it to me, but we must remember this. We did not fail at anything. You didn't fail. Whatever you were doing, whether you were trying to be a wedding magician, you were trying to be, you know, a stage magician, you were about to get your first cruise gig, you were about to do a theatre show, whatever it was or whether you were about to spend a year touring in the Illusionist or, Ch or, or Champions of Magic or whatever, you didn't, you didn't fail. Nothing, you didn't fail. It was all taken away from all of us. And so that's the thing when, you, when you're feeling down or you're feeling crap about everything, 
tell yourself that because it's really important. It certainly helped me at times when I've really been at my lowest to go, yeah, you know what? Like I didn't, I didn't fail. This was all taken away from me and I was doing my best and working hard and it's all just, you know, no one could have seen it coming sort of thing. So yeah, like I've, I've had a, I've had a really tough year. I, I think the thing for me, I realized it yesterday is just, I'm just normally a very happy guy and, um, and I love to laugh and I'm quite mischievous and mischievous. And, uh, I like, you know, hanging out with my friends and I love going to the theater to see things and I can't do any of it. <laughs> like, and it's just been tough. And, and of course it's why I'm absolutely miserable. You know, it's like, and just thank God for great friends. And guess what? The ones that have got me through the last year, I met them all through magic, you know, and it's like, so that's the beautiful thing. And uh, I see it a little bit online now. Magicians are getting a bit fed up and they're starting to fight on Facebook pages and stuff. It's just, I think it's just a level of frustration now. Magicians are pretty annoyed about things and they're starting to fight. But I will say, particularly in that first six months of the pandemic, we really rallied around each other, I think. And I, I, I personally felt that, that there was a, a lot of support and a lot of phone calls and a lot of people reassuring each other and, trying to help each other like we really are a little family and if you're new to magic and you're new to this channel that's the thing that I'd love the message for this to be from this interview is just almost forget the magic like you're gonna make great friends that will last your lifetime you're gonna meet some very strange people too it's very odd ones we're all very strange there's no exceptions <laughs> but you are going to make the best friends you can possibly imagine. And you're going to share something in common. You're going to have this bond, this strange thing, these tricks that, that just, we love to talk about and everything. And, and yeah, that's for me, the greatest gift that magic has given me is my, without a doubt, is, is my friends around me. And I didn't realize it initially, but I really do now. I realize that the greatest gift magic has given me is my friends. Well, you know, we don't know each other personally, but we have mutual friends. And every single person that I've spoken to has said that you are the nicest person on the planet and that you'd do anything for anybody, which speaks volumes to me, really, when, when you know, you, you have that sort of impact on people. It's... That's nice to hear. I, I don't, yeah, I, I'm amazed people say that about me. That's really, that's really, really nice. Yeah, I, I think genuinely i'm very happy in, in normal times i feel i think this is the case with every, any human being actually not just me or any but i think if you're happy in life generally if you create a good life for yourself where you're you're doing what you want to do and you're surrounded by great people it does it just brings out the best in all of us doesn't it it really does like you know and and i i, I love it sometimes when i see magicians you've seen this and you know when magicians change maybe they get into it and they're a bit over ambitious or they they I don't know they, they're a bit angry like they're a bit frustrated and, and they're, 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 let's be blunt they're often sometimes they're dicks and the wonderful thing is actually sometimes you see people change and you see people become better people and they take a step back from magic and they they reflect on it or they question their own behaviors or and and we we do I think I think magic we all know this that magicians get into it and they get sometimes a big ego because of magic i don't think it lasts forever if you've got good friends around you they'll put they'll... Like life now richard at this point <laughs> <laughs> well, if you got if you got good friends around you they'll police that ego i certainly had that you know being at gigs everybody telling you you're amazing well if you've got a lot of friends they all do the same thing and they're all you realize you're not a genius if you've got an omni deck in your pocket and a bottle through table gimmick it's like oh i've got mates who, other mates who can do this as well so that's quite a good i definitely have had that where my friends particularly in my early 20s when i started doing it started doing a lot of gigs and people telling me i was amazing and why are you not on britain's got talent and i was making more money than i thought was possible through being an unknown close-up magician like it was like, yeah, my friends that kind of like, you know, you're nothing special, man. <laughs> like you're, you're just like us. And it's good. It's what you need to hear to keep the ego in check. And most of those magicians who have absolutely out of control egos and elitists, as you said in your video, I, I'd like to think most of them at some point mellow out a bit and kind of, they get it. They see what the big picture is eventually. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And, and we're filming this 
almost at the beginning of April 2021. And obviously these YouTube videos go up and they get found over time. So, uh, you know, anybody who's looking at this in the future, all I can say is it's starting to look like there's light at the end of the tunnel. Let's hope so. Yeah, I, people are starting to make inquiries, aren't they? And people are starting to feel like they can make some plans. I definitely know that because somebody cancelled me for their wedding uh, earlier today, which was <laughs> it was like it was quite interesting. It was this uh, this very brief story, but yeah, I had this uh, young lady who got in touch with me, wanted to be, book me for a wedding because I did a sister's wedding years ago, and I sort of said I don't really sort of do it anymore. Oh, please, can you do it? It wouldn't be. I always wanted you at my wedding. She did my sister's wedding, so I booked it. I said, okay, and booked it. And then, of course, the pandemic happened. got put back, put back. And then this morning I woke up. It was the first message I read this morning. It was from this bride saying, we are finally able to do our wedding, but we have to keep the numbers small. So I'm so sorry we can't have you at the wedding. I'm just like, this is hilarious. <laughs> but at least she's getting, the most importantly, at least she is getting to have her wedding finally. So it is a good sign, actually, believe it or not, that that text message that people are starting to feel they can do things and they can make plans and yeah that's one one person that i've lost a gig it doesn't matter like it's a sign that things are starting to return to normal so let's hope it continues absolutely now before we wrap all things up i just want to ask you one more question which is what's next let's just assume that the world doesn't turn into some sort of post-apocalyptic society we do get back to normal and i'm not talking about a new normal i'm talking about a normal where my kids can hug other kids and everything's you know good let's just assume that for a minute because I, i'm a positive person and i like to believe that that's going to be the case sooner rather than later what are you what 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 have you got left to achieve in your career richard i'll, I'll tell you i mean do you have any anything left on your bucket list what what is it that you want to do? Uh, and what I mean by that is you've, you've achieved so much. Obviously, you've got the Changing Cards company. You, you, we've already kind of, you've mentioned, is that something you're going to continue? Are you going to go back to Young and Strange? How long will you continue Young and Strange for? You've talked about traveling around the world for 40 weeks a year. You know, Sam's obviously got kids now. Where are you, you know, that, um, personally, outside of Young and Strange? What are your plans? Oh, that's the, you know what? Uh, great final question. Better than any final question I ever used to ask. So well done. Um, so yeah, listen, uh, the, the, the young and strange longevity, I think will somewhat come down to Sam and his personal circumstances. Like I said, he's, he's, a, he's a dad now and he's got another kid on the way. His wife is amazing. She's very understanding and she's very supportive. So I don't think it will be as soon as you think. And I think there's some interesting ways around Sam maybe not being able to do Champions of Magic all the time that actually will still allow Young and Strange to be in the show. It's, I won't bore you with it, but there, there is some... Baby Barney, of course. Yeah, Baby Barney. Uh, <laughs> plans for the immediate future. I want to have a haircut. I haven't had one since December. And uh, my, I haven't been able to colour my hair. So, I mean, it's grey as a goat. Look, I'd like to colour my hair again. At least um, you have hair, Richard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess you're right. Um, but I think in terms of what I want to do, in my bucket list, there's one thing left I really want to do. And it's kind of stupid, really. I think Alex, the producer of Champions of Magic, you know, the dream would be to do Broadway. For me, it isn't Broadway. I would love to do Vegas for a little while. For me, that's the place. I love it so, so much. I find it's the most exciting place if you're a magician. And so even just a week run or something, I'd love to say we did Vegas for a little while. Do you think that's possible for you to achieve with, with, with the fact that you're part of a touring illusion show that tours in America? And Vegas is the capital of magic in America. Surely that's something. It's totally. I, I, I don't. I don't know all the ins and outs of it. But I think it's a totally different business. Like it's just. It's the same as. No, it's not the same. But like you know, it's like you want to tour around the UK playing with large centres. You can more than if you want to do the. You know, you want to do the West End. It's totally different. And so, I don't know all the ins and outs of Alex's business. I, I, it's certainly not as straightforward as people think it is. So. I, I really hope we get to do that at some point. I, uh, I, can under, I could understand, and he's never said this, but I could understand actually why a producer wouldn't want to do it. 
like why would you want to go into a onto one street in america that's got 200 shows on every night like and be in that pool of competition when actually you can go and play omaha nebraska and you're the only show on and people will come so i don't i don't know if we'll ever do it i i really really hope we uh i really really hope we will um and at some point other than that i just i really love magic more i think i love magic more now than i've ever loved it the the extra little things that have come in this year where i've been making gimmicks and doing written articles and 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 i've been learning we talked about this earlier in fact i i wonder if dave would tell us you know i wonder who has spent more money at prop dog over the last year me or you i reckon you we could be their number one number two customer i think we could you know because <laughs> i order i order from prop dog normally a couple of times a week like at least sort of thing so and i love i love prop dog and i love supporting a brick and mortar magic shop like you know he, they, those guys they they've they got absolutely the right intentions and for me that's the most important thing they want to support magicians they want to give good advice they will happily say when something shit like you do on here and say don't waste your money i just i i think they're great and so yeah i i just want to continue to 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 learn magic and uh get better at it i think i might go back and watch your video with the okito box and actually buy one and see if i can do a put together a little routine for my own amusement I learned Homer Luwag's coin one a few years ago for no reason. Great, great reason. Love it. And so maybe I should learn a Craig Petty Akito box. What do you reckon, routine? Absolutely. I'll send you one of my DVDs. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And Richard, on that note, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Um, where can people find you on socials? Where can, when can people connect with you? Obviously, right now at the bottom of the screen, we have the changing cards websites yes change, change, please, change. <laughs> please support richard please go and buy changing cards i do them all the time ryland does them all the time uh and, and the torn and restored card is amazing it brought back so many memories everything's available on that site um outside of changing cards is there anywhere else that people can connect with you uh so so yeah changingcards.com uh i will just say this as well you can get changing cards from prop dog uh they're i'm very proud stockist and magic box in newcastle also have them too and alakazam have a few left as well so there's a few like support these magic shops the reason i, I can tell you this the reason those three magic shops have changing cards and they have the torn restore card if they want it is because they are a brick and mortar magic shop i don't mind telling you i had lots of online magic shops that wanted to stock them and Bob and I agreed, no. The, the magic shops that stock them are brick and mortar magic shops because they deserve our support. Uh, so yeah, there you go. If that's controversial, so be it. Uh, but that we, we, we believe that was the right thing to do. Um, so uh, okay. yeah, yeah, so um, in terms to supporting it, I'm on Instagram at Richard Young Magic. Uh, Young and Strange obviously has a uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I'm on, I'm on everything. I'm not very interesting on any of it. Um, but, uh, you know, if you've got, I will say this, listen, I mean, crikey, I can't believe anyone would have listened to all of this, but if, if you have, if I can, I will say this, if I can help you in any way with your magic, drop me a message. Anyway, I really mean it. Like Bob, when I was a kid, Bob helped me for years and never took any money off me. If I can help you in any way, whether you want to ask a question, advice, or you want to get into illusions or anything, if there's anything I've said here, I didn't say it clear enough, or you're still not sure, drop me, drop me a message. I'm not going to try and sell you anything. I'll more than happily help anybody uh, with their magic. You don't have to be, you don't have to be a kid. You don't have to be new. Um, I'm happy to help anyone. I really mean that. That's the least I can do. That is an incredible offer. Um, Richard, you are amazing. And, uh, and, and hopefully one day you'll bring back the Magicians uh, podcast. That would be cool. Even if it's just for one-off episode or something, that would be. Well, listen, and thank you so much for having me on. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, th listen, thank you also for what, what you're doing, Craig. I really mean it. I really sincerely mean it. I told you I've been sat here making the cards over the last couple of weeks. And I've been going back through all your stuff. I've listened to so much great stuff. Uh, and... But yeah, thanks for what you're doing. I, uh, I really wish you continued success with it. I think your audience will continue to grow. And 
yeah yeah i i really appreciate the, the entertainment you've given me so thanks i appreciate that you're more than welcome thank you so much richard it means a lot coming from you um guys leave a comment down below richard will see it um so please leave the comments down below and uh yeah if you want to see more videos like this subscribe to the channel leave a uh, leave a like and all that fun stuff and i'm going to be back tomorrow with another three videos of shorts at two uh magic live at six and there'll be something going up at nine so there you go uh i'll see you again soon thanks very much take care goodbye everybody <laughs>